Access code, I'm not sure which right. which or what's an O or it's the O or I code, and it's right here. Right here. So are those O's? Yeah, it's 0380. 0380 C. So E D O, yeah, the letter O, E D O H. Mm -hmm. So it's Department of Health. Okay. 0380. Zero Z. Okay, zero. so I punched the O R I code and not the X. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let me um let me finish getting ready and then we will. Uh, I'm just gonna get set up and then I'll get the next person number back. We have to have that scheduled before we can oh, yeah. apply for the, the state test. You have to have the background check on file. Okay. okay. They, yeah, I get it. Mm -hmm. That they can pull to put with your application to send to the board of nurse. And um, if you don't have a background check that they find, that's going to stop your application process. Okay, but so I will have that recommended is to do the background check first, okay. apply for the test, and then wait for the approved. If you apply for the test without the background check and they go to find it, it's not there. That stops the whole process. Okay. And then when you go for the background check, it takes a little bit of time um, then to pair up that background check with the application. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just do my first. I don't know. Someone's first day, and I don't remember.
I have to be the same. Oh, yeah, I'm going to be the same. 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 Thank you. Okay, good morning, good morning. Mm -hmm. Happy Monday. Okay, does anybody have any questions for me? Anything that you read that you need to explain? Anything that you missed that you need me to go over? Anything you're concerned about? <laughs> oh, one more thing. Sure. I, as long as I file, mm -hmm. I mean, do I have to have the test done first before I can apply for the state exam? What do you mean the test? You the class? The, uh, no, the um the background have to check. So the way that it works, so that okay, so there's there's several steps to the process. There's background check, mm -hmm. there's test registration, there's approval by the board of nursing, and then there's test schedule. Those are four stages. So you can't get 
to stage three without having stage one and two done. Okay, so we have to have the background check and we have to have the test registration. That gets bundled together and sent to the Board of Nursing to approve you for testing. Okay, now you can do the registration without the background check, but the problem is they're two separate places. Mm -hmm. So when you register for the test, they go over to a filing cabinet, they look for you. If you're not there, your folder gets put on a pile somewhere way over there. You go get a background check, and now they've got to go find your file and match it with the background check, and that's going to take way longer. Okay. If you already have the background check done, when you register for the test, they go in the filing cabinet, they pull it, they put it together, they send it to the Board of Nursing. Okay. It streamlines the experience significantly, which is why I've got on that sheet of paper, step one is the background check. Step two is test registration. So, yep, that page right there. So, step one is the background check. And I've got it in that, that order specifically to help streamline the, the system. You can register. There's no problem. Anybody can register with tests. The problem is your registration is going to stop right there. And it's going to sit. And even when you go get the background check, that's fine, but it's not automated. Somebody still has to go look at that stack of we're waiting ons and then go to the filing cabinet. And it's a now it's a manual process instead of being an automated. I got it. Okay. Oh, um, I just do you have two packets or did Oh, just have one. I think I just have one. Okay, so were you here on Wednesday? No. Okay. All right. Um, give me just a, a on break. Okay. I'll print out a packet for you because I only print enough for the students that are here. Okay. Um, that one just happened to be my copy. <laughs> so when yeah, if you don't come on test registration day, I don't have any printed because it's eight pages and then they just sit around. And the registration packet changes from time to time. Mm -hmm. So if I have a whole bunch printed out, they're no longer any good. And, um, we have background check already. You already have a background check, a level two with photo um, for healthcare. That has to be for healthcare. If you had a background check done for a concealed carry, it doesn't work. If you had one done working health or a daycare, it doesn't work. If you had one for a bank, it doesn't work. Foster care, it doesn't work. It was a hospital, the receptionist. Okay, has to be a level two with photo in healthcare. So I went to, um, I guess, the UPS or something. Okay, there. yep. So that's the major thing. Yeah, but UPS does all of the background checks. So okay. just because you go to that place doesn't mean you got the right background. Okay. It's all about the filing cabinets, the backgrounds get put in. And this is something that a lot of people don't understand is that when you get a background check done, we actually voted on this about eight years ago in Florida, by the way. This was on the state um, election ballot. They wanted to, anytime you got a background check done for anything, put it in one filing cabinet so everybody else could find it too. That way you only had to have one done. <laughs> but uh, the Florida voters said, no, we don't like that. We don't want agencies being able to access our information so now they can't share. So everybody has their own filing cabinet and the information is not shared back and forth. There's no way if you had a background check done, there's no way for me to know or you to know what filing cabinet went into. And if it's in the wrong filing cabinet, they're not going to be able to find it because they don't have the keys for those cabinets. Does that make sense? I know it's kind of a, it's, it's a tricky thing. Um, if, if you worked in healthcare then and you had one in the last five years and they took your picture, you're probably fine. Register. And then when you get the, the um, email from back from Prometric, it'll say record found or record not found. If it says record not found, you need to get your background check done because you're not going to get any further. So I will point you when you register. You register. Good. Makes sense. That's it's confusing. 
And it's a long registration packet. When you do the background check, um, the, the, the one you do for this, the CNA, it has DTIS. Deontis? Yeah. D A O N T I S? Is that? It just said D T I S. Fingerprints, you see. I'm wondering if she did it for this. Of my daughter, the one who did the application. And I went and did it, but I'm wondering how she said it was. Um, I'm going to check this. Okay, yes, it's your fingerprints to receive. You don't have to send it anywhere. It says fingerprints received. No, it's not, it's it's not, it's just that's a generic email that goes out when it, it doesn't have anything to do with seeing it. It's just a generic email for all this stuff. Okay. Yeah, I did just called until someone answered me because I had on a good amount of it. So you want to look at all them and maybe you don't think about it. And then uh, one of the things that people think of is I don't like it. So you can write down there, you know, to put in the piece of the book for what you need to know. They got it back. What's that? The back of the strategy. Yeah, I want to show the kid is not seeing. If you look on the, you're you're going to want to go back and review Wednesday's class. So, if you look on that paper I gave, okay, the four columns, the very first one, go to Deontis. They're in Spring Hill, okay, where the ORI code is. Right. Go to Deontis, register. You'll pay online. You'll make an appointment. They have appointments same day. Oh. Could be tomorrow. I mean, yeah. you know, they have appointment availability. You're going to go in. They'll take your photo. They'll take fingerprints. They'll get a signature from you. I say your ID to prove your view. Yeah. And then that gets transmitted to the Department of Health, that filing cabinet, immediately. You can do your fingerprints, go out to your car, and do your registration. Oh, okay. It's not, yeah, there's no, it's an automated process. So there's weight involved. Okay. Now the problem is this is why I, I give you that because I know Deontis works. I've had students that have gone to other places and gotten a background check done, but it got routed to the wrong place. And then they had to go, the, their whole test registration process stopped and they had to go do it again. And then they call me and start yelling at me. I did a background check. Why can't they find it? I don't know. Use the one I gave you <laughs> because I know that one works. It is an approved provider. It is a live scan. It has to be live scan. There is no wait. It, it's it's the easiest, most secure option that I know will work. Um, but I had um, I probably it was last year. I probably had four or five students that got together and they decided to go somewhere else. And it took them three months to test. So when I give you this information, it's because we've tried all the other options of trying to prevent um, you guys from having an issue down the road that I can't help you solve. So if you just follow that paper, that paper tells you all four steps exactly what to do. The first one is background screening. Go to Deontis, register for background screening, use that ORI code. After you do the background screening, then apply for the test using the test registration instructions on my website. I gave you the application, so you can use that as a template. After that, you'll get an email. Open the attachments in the email and look to make sure it says record found, and it'll say pending approval. That means that they're waiting on the Board of Nursing to approve. They've sent it over. They're just waiting on the Board of Nursing to approve you. Then you'll get another email after about a week or 10 days, and that one will say approved. After that, that, that means that the Board of Nursing said, yes, you're good to test. They sent that to Prometric. 
Prometric's going to schedule your test and you'll get an email for your test date. Okay. So the process is pretty seamless um, as long as you follow those four steps. Other than that, you can get like super lost in, you know, kind of a limbo world. <laughs> So, um, but go back and watch the end of Wednesday's class because I go over all of that to make sure that you guys truly understand it. But I also have test registration instructions on my website that show you the whole process in detail. Turn this off. <coughs> I just took the camera. Okay, how many of you guys have accepted your invitation to the online program? Did you? I think from like I can't find What's that? From like I can't find You can't find it? In your email, the invitation? Invitation software. For our online program, the CNA test prep online course. When did that get sent? It would have been after day one, at the end of day one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I said that um, I think we had asked, it was last week or the week before, we were getting emails. And prior to that day, I wasn't getting any, but after that day, I started to get them. Okay. Um, make sure you stop after class and let me get into my computer and just verify that you, that the invitation was sent to you. Okay. Um, because that's going to be important. Okay. That online course, um, I have a whole section in there on test registration and testing timeline. All of that is inside that online course. Do you mean your online site? Not the site. Okay. So we actually have two specific sites. We have foryourcna.com, which is what's on your book. This is our, what we call our public facing site or our free site. Everything on there is free. As review videos, animated lessons, workplace, request, all kinds of stuff. Ebook for the written test. But we also have courses.foryourcna.com and for your CNA, for your CNA .com links to it. So you can actually see at the top menu, mm -hmm. online CNA test prep course. Click that, it'll take you to my courses site. Mm -hmm. That online course has a ton of information that I'm not giving you in class. Is this where the activities and things are? Right, all of the, yeah, the in interactive activities, mm -hmm. so your supply gathering, your steps. Mm -hmm. um, it has information on um, abnormal values. I've got flashcards in there for medical terminology and abbreviation. So there's a lot of stuff in there that we don't necessarily go over in class. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of important that you have access that um, and got it set up while you still have me to, to troubleshoot that because you'll be able to access that for a year after the program for review. That's going to be super important when you go to test. Okay. So what I'm giving you in here is, in reality, um, you know, I'm giving you a lot of information, but you're just sitting there and soaking it in. The online course is the other half of the program where you can actually start putting that information into practice. So think of it like show and tell, right? Right now I'm showing you the online course helps you tell me that you got it. Good. A lot of people don't realize because they think, okay, I'm coming to class, that's enough. A lot of people don't realize that there's a whole lot more available to you to help you pass the test. If you pay attention in class and do that online program, you are guaranteed to pass on your first try. Okay. So just a little bit of time investment for you. All right. Grab 
Okay, I get some questions from YouTube world. Good morning, YouTube. Um, Solomon Esther says, please, can someone be licensed or take the state exam from you? No, I don't license. I, I don't certify. That's not my role. I'm a teacher. I'm going to teach you how to get ready for the certification program, but you have to take the state test. Everybody takes the state test. Doesn't matter what state you're in, you're going to take the test for that state. Now in Florida, you can challenge the exam. Any other state, you have to go through a CNA school to be eligible. A lot of schools use our training program, which is why you might be watching me. If you're enrolled in a school, they're going to help you with your application, your, your registration. Um, where do I go for a background check? Depends on the state you're in, Steve. Um, if you are um, in Florida, go to fouryearcna.com under testing tab, look at test registration instructions and background check. I've been for two lessons in the free online um, website for your cna.com i've got all of that information in there um can you please put a link in the chat for them for test registration instructions on the main site and the background check and uh can you put the information in the description box yes um i will ask mine to do that internet says please put information in the chat all right my please link to those two pages for our youtube followers all right, so let me get your scores for chapters five and six. So, is it Saroni? Sirogeny. Sirogeny? Even calling Sue. Sue, okay. So I owe you for chapter one, that was 95 percent. Okay. What else do I have? Three. 95. Thank you. Five. Thank you, and six. Not that. That's fine. Crystal? Cynthia? Um, six foot, no, five is 100%, six, I didn't finish. Okay, no problem. Yvonne? Didn't get to finish any of the two. Okay. Well, I was dragging. No problem. Wilma? Kari? I got um, 95 on chapter five. And a hundred on chapter six. Thank you. Do you have four for me by any chance? Because mm -hmm. that would have been Wednesday. I would have got that on. Wednesday. Oh, I got negative one. Okay, very good. Ninety-five. Okay, Five. Leah. Four for four, I got a hundred. Um, for five, I got a hundred, and for six, I missed one. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and Amber. Okay. All right. Any questions on those? Thank you, Ma. You're awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions, guys? Okay. We are going to um, move on to the skills that we have today. We have four skills to learn. Some of them are going to be new concepts for us. Some of them are going to be um, kind of reusing the concepts that we've already learned. We should, barring any complications, have about a half hour to 45 minutes of practice time at the end of class today for you guys to start practicing the skills that you've learned. Um, on Wednesday, we should have about 45 minutes to an hour. We are now halfway through the program. Today is our halfway point. So you only have four classes, including today. If you are behind on the reading and the homework, um, these next two weeks are gonna go by super fast. So be aware of that. Um, try not to get too far behind because otherwise you're gonna be trying to race to get to the end, okay? All right, so the first thing that we're going to learn today is range of motion, elbow and wrist. Do you guys remember the range of motion that we learned on Wednesday? Range of motion of the shoulder. Do you guys remember that? We read the care plan. We do the exercises indicated on the care plan. We do the amount of repetitions on the care plan and we are exercising the body part indicated on the care plan, right? So we're just gonna follow the recipe, that's it. And that's all we're gonna do here too. 
This is range of motion, elbow and wrist, so different body part. But we have to go to that um, care plan and find out which side, which exercises, and how many repetitions. And then we put an opening in front, a closing behind, and that's the whole skill. This is the shortest skill that we have. It is the shortest skill. So we're going to get to that first. And then we're going to move on into denture care. Um, if you remember on class two, we learned mouth care. Denture care is mouth care with an extra step. So everything we did for mouth care, we're going to do again. But we're also going to clean the dentures as well at the same. But I'm going to kind of explain to you the scenario that they have put in place for us for this. And I need to explain to you a little bit about um, some things to be aware of with dentures. So a little bit of a lecture there, a little bit of background that you need to learn. We're gonna learn how to ambulate with a gait belt. Now, we're, this is our last principle. So if you remember, we've learned skill rules, right? We follow the care plan, the whole care plan and nothing but the care plan. We've learned the opening, not, 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 hi, Ms. Jones, my name is Patty, I'm your CNA today, I'm here to whatever, is that okay? Close curtain, wash hands. We learned the barrier. That's the first thing we get after we wash our hands, put it on the table, go back and get the rest of our supplies. We don't want to hold the supplies in our uniform, right? We've learned when to wear gloves. Remember, it's not based on the skill, it's based on the patient. And we're going to look at that patient and try to figure out if we're going to touch anything ooey personal skin or non-intact skin. If the answer is yes or maybe, we need gloves. But if we're going to wear gloves, the first thing the gloves should touch is the patient. We've learned about privacy blanket. We're going to wear, use a privacy blanket anytime the patient's uncovered or undressed. And this has to do with warmth, but it also has to do with the stranger in the room with the patient, right? Making sure that they have some dignity. We don't want to snap or shake that blanket because if we do, we aerosolize all of the patient's pathogens for you to breathe in. So don't do that. Um, make sure that you pull the sheet down under so the patient is always covered. Don't take the sheet off and then put the blanket on. You don't want the patient uncovered. So the patient always has to be covered. And when we're going to remove the privacy blanket, it's always done after you remove gloves because you don't want to touch that sheet. It's going to come right up next to their face with dirty gloves, right? Good. We learn linen rules. If you don't use it, you lose it. You've got to put it in dirty linen. Don't leave it in the room for later. Don't put it back in clean supply. You either use it on the patient or it gets discarded. We don't hold anything up next to our uniform. Nothing touches the floor. So clean or dirty does not go on the floor. Um, we've learned that the patient always has to be in the middle of the bed and we're going to remain behind the patients behind. So in order to make that happen, we're going to scoot the patient toward us before we roll them. <laughs> right, we're not going to have side rails in all settings. We've learned washing rules. We're going to get water, we check it, they check it. You need a paper towel to turn the faucet on. We're not going to add soap to the basin. Whatever we wash, we rinse. Whatever we rinse, we dry. If we're going to use lotion, we'll warm it up first, apply it, and then wipe off that excess. Right? We've learned how to clean the basins. For the test, we simply rinse them, dry them, and store them. No fuss, no muss but the process allows for disinfection by setting that basin down in the sink after we dump it out, after we rinse it. That way, if we do need to disinfect it, the process is already there. We can just spray it and then use a paper towel to pick it up. We already know how to do that. Anything that normally goes in the toilet goes in the toilet. Anything that normally goes in the sink goes in the sink. Don't get all wrapped up in that, nobody cares. Um, and we've learned the closing. Thank you very much, Ms. Jones. Is there anything else I can help you with? Would you like a magazine before I go? Here's your call light. Your environment is clean. I'm going to open the curtain and then go clean my hands. If I have to document, I'll document after washing my hands. And then I'm going to clean my hands again because we need to end skill with clean hands. Right? We learned all that. <clears throat> so I have just summed up the last two weeks in five minutes. So the only thing that we have left to learn is shoe rules. And we did go over some of this on Wednesday. So we learned that slipper socks are not enough.
because slipper socks do not protect against sharp objects or injury. So walking somebody in slipper socks is not enough. It also allows pathogens to be on the socks, which are then gonna climb into bed with the patient. That's not a good combination, right? So we've learned those things. We know that if the patient's feet hit the floor, we're gonna talk about their shoes. So we've learned a few of the principles involved in shoe rules, but we have a few more we still have to learn. And that's what we're going to learn right before we talk about ambulate with a gate valve, right before I show you that skill. But that's it. Then we're done with all of the principles. And then we're just gonna use those principles to create other skills. Now, why is this important? Because when you get out there and you start working, you're gonna to have to learn new skills based on the setting that you're gonna work in. Remember, this doesn't end your education, this just begins it. But we're laying a foundation that you're gonna be able to build on. So if you have to learn how to wash something later on down the road, you already know the washing rules. If you're going to help with um, uh, surgical cleanup at the bedside, you know, bedside procedures, you now know the basin cleaning procedures. If you are going to learn how to um, remove catheters, you know that the first thing your gloves should touch is the patient or what's coming out of the patient, right? So these rules lay a foundation that you will be building on from this point in your career. And that's why they're so important. So you do need to know them. Guys, every test question that you're going to have is gonna to refer to something on that back wall. Okay? Good? Make sense? Mm -hmm. And you already know them all already. Good job. So you should feel proud of yourselves. This is a huge accomplishment. And I know when you walked in the first day and I told you you're gonna learn all that, you went, Ugh! Because you're thinking you got to memorize stuff. I don't want you to memorize anything. I want you to truly take it in and make it part of you. And if you do that, man, CNA is so easy. Because you never really have to think about how to do things. You've already got the foundation laid. This is what we call best nursing practices, which is what you see back there. Okay, good. Questions? So we're going to learn how to ambulate with a gate belt. And then the last skill we're gonna to learn to do today is partial bed bath. Now, this is a long skill. The state says that somebody with your level of experience should be able to get this done in 19 minutes. It is a long skill. And there's a lot of steps involved. Don't let that intimidate you. You know all the steps already. Before I even show you this skill, you already know the steps. We know the opening. We know the barrier. We know to wear gloves because we're going to touch wet body openings, the eyes, nose, mouth. We know that privacy blanket is important if a patient's going to be uncovered or undressed. We know our linen rules. Don't hold your linens up next to your uniform. If you don't use it, discard it. We know our washing rules. We know that the patient must remain in the middle of the bed at all times. So we're going to scoot them and then roll them to wash their back. We know how to clean the basin when we're all done. We know how to do the closing. There isn't a single thing in this skill that's foreign to you except how to use the washcloth. So I'm going to teach you a brand new way of using a washcloth that you probably haven't seen before which is pretty interesting, actually. <clears throat> and you'll find a million uses for it after I show it to you. It's called the leaves method. Um, and we're going to use that anytime we wash wet body openings. Remember on week uh, one, we talked about what a wet body opening was. We talked about chain of infection, right? Remember we have a pathogen. That pathogen has to have a doorway out. Then it has to have a way to get to somebody else then it has to have a doorway in. And most of those doorway outs and ends are wet body openings because pathogens need liquid to travel, right? So wet body openings are eyes, nose, mouth, genitals, rectal area, 
wounds, rashes, sores, and incisions. Anything that opens the skin and has liquid where stuff can travel, right? Well, because we're washing the face, that has like the majority of your wet body openings in the body. <laughs> so we need a new way of washing where we're not cross contaminating. So that's a very long skill. It's going to take me some time to talk to you about and to teach you about, but it's not overly hard. It's just long. And then after we get that done, you'll have some practice. Okay, good. Good. All right, before we get started on all that, I want to talk to you about Teams Report, though. Go to page 76 for me in your white book. <clears throat> Esther, I'm located in Florida. I'm not sure where you're located, but I'm located in Florida. Okay, Teams Report. So when you go to work, wherever it is that you decide you're gonna to go to work, and by the way, you do know that all settings are not the same. We've talked about that a little bit, but if you're gonna to go to work in a hospital, that's a completely different type of CNA work than somebody that's working in a rehab. And that's completely different CNA work than somebody that's working in mental health. And that's completely different CNA work than somebody that's gonna work one-on-one -on -one with a patient at home. Their different settings will require different skills from CNAs. You have to figure out where you belong. Not everybody is meant for home care. Not everybody is meant for the hospital. Not everybody is meant for hospice. Right, you got to figure out your niche, and that's going to have a lot to do with your personality. I am a high energy person. I like to be constantly challenged. If you give me too much downtime, my brain gets going, and that's no good for anybody. Okay, so home care, private care, not good for me at all. Way too much downtime. So I know that I don't thrive in that environment, but man, you put me in the ICU, give me some cardiac patients and I'm your girl, right? I like you know, the, the crazier, the better, right? I like to be challenged. So I need to know that about myself because if I put myself in a position that my personality isn't suited for, I'm not going to feel fulfilled my patient isn't going to get the best type of care and the I'm probably going to leave the facility. So now they're short staff. So you need to kind of figure out where you belong. And I've made it easy for you. Go take my personality quiz. It's on the website for this one right here for your CNA.com under training. It's the ideal work, your ideal workplace. Go take the personality quiz. It'll take you maybe 10 minutes to go through and it's surprisingly accurate. I tested it on hundreds of currently working healthcare employees to dial this in. People that are currently working and it is scary accurate, scary accurate. Are you able to do that from the people that you know you're applying to? What do you mean? Recommend? Go take the quiz because it's going to ask you very specific okay. questions. It's going to ask you things like, um, do you prefer, uh, how do you feel about um, lots of equipment, medical equipment, you know, things that beep and lines and tubes mm -hmm. and all of those things, right? If you walk into a room and there's all kinds of medical equipment and your heart stops because you don't know what that is and you're scared to death, the hospital may not be the right place for you, right? Home care or assisted living where they don't have that kind of stuff might be a better fit. Are you very team oriented? Do you like working closely with a team or are you the type of person that just wants your assignment, be left alone, do your job and then go home? 
that has a lot to do with what type of setting you're going to find, you know, that, that you're going to find your stride in. Does that make sense? So I don't know those things about you guys. It's 19 questions, but it's not asking you what is the meaning of BRP. It, it, it's not, it's based on you and your personality. Okay. So it, it's a, it's an innovative, really cool quiz to help you kind of decipher a little bit more about yourself and your work style to figure out where you fit. So does it, at the end of the quiz, does it kind of give you like a Oh my God, of, it's well, an entire here. huge page of um, information. So it's going to say, congratulations, you're going to thrive in a hospital setting. And in a hospital setting, this is the pace. This is the type of environment. These are the types of coworkers, your pay rates, uh, you, know, um, you know, lower than average, average, higher than average, opportunity for advance opportunity to learn new skills all of that is detailed on your results page and then it's going to link you to others so you get hospital and cool yeah that that pretty much sums me up but i wonder what it would be like to work in a rehab just click that button and it'll give you the same information but for the rehab setting and then oh pediatrics i never thought about that let me click that button and read through that so there's nine different what would modalities or workplaces that I feature. There are others that seem to work in, but I just focus on the top nine. Okay. One more question, really quick. I wanted to know who would be your typical CNA in the hospital? Like, who would we generally come across? Because I've never identified a CNA. I'm not sure what I'm thinking about. So the CAs are gen in a hospital, generally the ones that are answering the call lights. Okay. They're the ones that bring the vital signs carts in and do the vital signs. Even like a labor and delivery? Depends. Okay. Depends. Okay. Remember that CNAs are, what is, what does CNA stand for? Get rid of the certified. What is, what, what is, what's the name? Okay, so who do we assist? The nurse. Okay, so that by definition, if we're an assistant, right? By definition, our nurse can do everything we can do. Mm -hmm. We're there to assist. We're doing routine tasks on stable patients according to the care plan. Well, when you go to the hospital, the first event is the pressure. Okay, yeah. I, I'm getting there. Hold on a second. Hold on, right? And then a big part of a CNA's job is to observe and report while you're doing those routine right. tasks, right? Everybody with me? Okay, but that means that a nurse can do what we do. If we're working with a patient population that changes rapidly or has a high level of complexity, then generally speaking, the nurse will take care of those tasks because the patient is not stable. The tasks are not routine because there's a high amount of um, change, potential change. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Right? Right. So when you're talking about labor delivery or mother baby units, some mother baby units will have CNAs. Other mother baby units will not because they consider that an elevated level of service with higher complexity because you, you have the potential for hemorrhaging, you have the potential for prolapse, you have the potential for um, infection, you have the potential for lactation problems, you have the potential for um, birth uh, issues. So there's a higher level of complexity there. And some settings say, I'd rather have the nurse in there for all contact to be able to notice these changes much more rapidly. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Other settings say, yeah, we'll take a CNA and they can do the bottle of science, pass the water, you know, but most contact's going to be done with the nurse. But you know, we're, we're, we will delegate some things that are a little bit more routine. Mm -hmm. Every setting is going to be structured a little bit differently based on how the facility wants to manage their risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are some places that you will see a CNA working in ICU. I was that was but was the, NICU. the majority will not have CNAs working in ICU because it's a high level of complexity. These are not routine tasks on stable patients. Remember, that's the hallmark of what we do. Routine tasks on stable patients. And a lot of places consider an ICU neither. 
So same thing with NICU. These are not stable patients and these are not routine tests. So you may not find a CNA position in a NICU. And then there may be one right down the road that they do. So it, every facility is going to run a little bit different. But in a general, what we call a med surge or a general hospital environment, yeah, CNAs are going to come in and answer the call lights. They take the vital signs. They bring the um, water and snacks. They make the beds. They turn and reposition the patients. All the things I'm teaching you to do in here. Okay. But remember that nurses can do what you do. You were there just to take some of that burden off of them to free them up to do other higher level tasks. So in clinical critical settings, they may have CNAs. Okay. Help you? So wherever you go, pick a setting, right? Rehab, hospital, nursing home, pick a setting. Most of the time you're gonna be working as part of a team, which means somebody worked the hours before you, somebody is going to be there the hours after you because healthcare operates 24 hours a day. It's not like my retail store, right? My retail store, somebody comes, opens the door with a key, at 10 a.m., sees customers until 6 p.m., and then we lock the door with a key, right? And then we leave, and there's nobody here. So there's nobody that's going to tell you. When Jacob opens in 15 minutes, there's nobody standing there saying, okay, let me tell you what happened overnight. Because there was no overnight. No, nothing happened. It was locked up. But it's not how healthcare works. Healthcare works 24 hours a day. Which means in most settings, you're going to take report from the person that is leading. And they need to tell you some stuff about your patients. Now, this is going to vary depending on where you work, right? Remember I said that we're laying a foundation, but this is the beginning of your education, not the end. So if you're working in a hospital, let's just pick on a hospital for a second. If you're working in a hospital and you come on shift, the outgoing shift is going to give you reports. And they're probably not going to have anything printed because these patients change like all the time. There's admissions, there's discharges. Some people are only here 24 hours. Some people are here 24 days. It's kind of a, a mix of stuff. So there's nothing printed. They're going to give you an oral report. Okay, room two. You got a 36-year-old gallbladder that's scheduled to go home today, but they do everything on their own. They're just waiting on their discharge. Room two, bed B, that's an 86-year-old person who's bed-bound and needs to be turned and repositioned every two hours, needs peri care, need, you know, needs all of this care, right? So your report is going to tell you who your patient is, and what kind of care they need. Now, Remember that changes frequently because the patients change frequently. Now, in a nursing home, reports can be a little bit different. You're probably going to get a printed page because Henry's there, and there, Henry will keep being there until Henry's no longer here. So, we no, know all Henry, we've had him here for 16 years. Okay, yeah, I know it's tough. But we have a printed sheet that tells us our patient's name, kind of what, um, and then kind of what we need to do with them, their level of ability. Hospital, nothing's printed, nothing's oral. Nursing, um, it, it, but it tells you if anything has changed with patients. Like, oh, Roberta fell in her head yesterday. She's on vital signs every hour now. Or, uh, Henry is uh, being transferred to hospice this afternoon. Or um, Viola uh, is having a spat with her roommate. So they're going to kind of updates on what's patients, you know, at night. Sleep very well. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is called report, where you're getting information from the offgoing shift about the patients you're about to assume care for. Now, there, the problem is that a lot of times there's information that gets missed, 
right? Because you're relying on somebody to remember everything they did the shift before and tell you verbally. Stuff can get missed. So there is a way to do report where it's easy, consistent, and make sure that as a CNA, you have all the information you need on every patient you're caring for, and you can do it in 15 minutes or less because it's organized. And it's called the TEAMS report, T-E-A-M-S. Now, each one of these letters stands for something that CNAs need to do. So T is for toileting. That's always first on the list because every patient has to go, usually at shift change. And they're, you, don't, you don't know this patient. You don't know, are they, remember we talked about this on Wednesday, right? Are they bathroom privileges? They go on their own. Are they bathroom with a sit? Are they bedside commode on their own? Are they bedside commode with assist? Do they use a bedpan? Do they have a catheter? Are they incontinent? You need to know toileting right away. That's always first on the list because every patient needs to go. If they're not going, there's a problem, right? So T is for toileting. things. First thing you need to know about every patient, how do they toilet? E is for eating because again, this is something your patients are gonna do every shift. People eat. I don't know where it went. Oh, people eat. You need to know. Are they on a special diet? Do they need their food pureed? Are they on thickened liquids? Are they NPO, which means nothing by mouth? We need to know those things. Are we increasing fluids or restricting fluids? We need to know how to eat. It's a very special category. It applies to absolutely everybody, and you need to know it. What is specific to this patient? Then we get to A, which is ADLs. That's everything else. Bathing, dressing, grooming, you know, that kind of stuff. M is for mobility. M is a special category all on its own because mobility is important. Some patients will be on bed rest. Some patients will be ambulate with a gait belt, which we're going to learn today. Oh off screen. Some patients are ambulate with a gait belt. Some patients are uh, working with PT, learning to use a walker. Some patients are um, out of bed into a chair twice a day to help with circulation and respiration and all of those things. So M is for mobility. It's a special category just for mobility. You need to know that too. Because if you walk into a patient's room, you see this patient laying in bed, you might think to yourself, oh, you need to get up. Are they allowed to? I don't know. We need to find out, right? And then S is for special. You know, this is for the patient that fell and is on vital signs every two hours or the one that's being transferred to hospice or all the special stuff that doesn't really fit under the other categories. Things you need to be aware of. If you use this method, report can be done on 15, 20 patients in 15 minutes. T-E-A-M-S. All right, let's go down the list. Bed one, T-E-A-M-S. Bathroom privileges, uh, regular diet, self-ADLs, up ad lib, they are here for blood pressure issues. You're taking their blood pressure every four hours. That's why they're here. Right, we like those patients. It requires very little intervention from us, right? T-E-A-M-S. If you get used to using this method, it is super easy to give and get report because on the other end of this shift, you're going to have to give report to uh, somebody else coming on and you want to go home, you have just worked eight to 12 hours. You want to go home. You don't want this report thing to take forever. You don't want them to be asking a million questions. So if you have a consistent, organized report format, it can get you out of the building way quicker. And then your facility will be super happy because they don't like overtime. Okay. Make sense? So you got T-E-A-M-S. I have an activity. I've got a whole lesson on this in the online program. 
and I have an activity where I give you a whole bunch of report things and you got to put them in the right box. D E A M S. Where does it belong? So it allows you to practice this. Okay. The online program will help you tremendously put into practice what I talk about in here. Remember, it's the other half of this coin. So let's go to page 55, range of motion, elbow, and wrist. So page 55 in your white book. Oh, awesome, NS. Thank you. That's awesome. Congratulations. Okay. So this care plan. Oh, we've already done the review. Okay, so page fifty-five of your of your um, skills book has the care plan there at the top of the page. This care plan says provide the following range of motion exercise to the resident's right elbow and right wrist flexion extension. Provide three repetitions of each exercise and the resident's not able to help with the exercises. Guys, an elbow is a hinge joint. This is all it will ever do. If you get an elbow to do something other than this, you broke it. <laughs> Guaranteed, it is a hinge joint. It only moves in these two directions, out and in. So flexion extension is all we will ever do on the elbow. But the wrist, it can move in all different directions. It can go up and down. It can go side to side. It can go around. It's an articulating joint. It can move in all different directions. Which directions are we going to use on this patient? Yeah, flexion extension, up, down. That's it. So this skill is up, down. How many times? Three. 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 And up, down. How many times? Yeah, put an opening in front and a closing in the back. That is it. That is the entire skill. Make sure you get the right one. Okay, so does the care plan count? Yes. What do we know about the care plan? Right, it gives us the details we need to do this exercise or, or this skill, right? So what happens if we don't follow the care? What happens to the patient if we don't follow the care plan. Yeah, yeah, it puts them at risk. Absolutely. Something bad could happen. We don't know what the bad is, but something bad could happen, right? So if something bad is happening to the patient, what does that do to your test score? Yeah. So the name of the game here is to read that care plan and follow it religiously. So if the care plan says right elbow and wrist, and during the test you get all confused, you do the left elbow and wrist, and you fail, please do not write me a letter saying, I don't understand why I failed. Because <laughs> I'll tell you why you failed. <laughs> That's right. So at the end of the skill, before you say, my skill is done, you should go back and read that care plan one more time and make sure that you did exactly what it said. Okay, good. The number one reason that people fail the state, the state exam is because they didn't follow the care plan. I mean, you could pretty much miss most of the physical performance steps as long as you followed the care plan. I mean, it really is that that important. Okay, good. So let's remember what our range of motion checkpoints were. Okay. So, well, let's review. <laughs> I got a lot of review here. <laughs> so let's review. Remember, range of motion is done to retain function, not regain. Who does stuff to regain? Yeah, physical therapy. We as CNAs can do three different exercises. We can do flexion extension, which is up down. We can do abduction, adduction, side to side, and we can do rotation. But not all exercises can be done on all joints. Remember, the elbow only goes up and down. 
So keep that in mind. Not all exercises can be done on all joints. We're going to follow the care plan. The nurse has already worked all that out for us. We don't have to think about it. We're just going to follow that care plan. But we always want to make sure that we're lifting from below. Remember that? We don't want to grab from above because that means that we have to grip tight and that can bruise the patient. We're going to return to start. So this is a full range of motion. When you go down and back up, don't come up a little ways. We're going to go down and all the way back to start. We're going to go down and all the way back to start. So remember, it's a full range of motion. We want to support at two joints. Now I'm going to show you how to do this where the bed is actually supporting the elbow. So, but both joints are supported. We're going to support the forearm. The bed is going to support the elbow. And we're going to monitor for pain, like asking, does that hurt? Are you having any pain? Are you comfortable? They need to hear you vocalize something about pain. But it's not just vocalizing. You also need to be watching the patient because some patients won't complain of pain. They kind of think that, oh, I'm here. This is supposed to hurt. So I'm going to try not to let anybody know. It's just part of what I'm doing, right? You've got a lot of very stoic people out there that try not to complain. So you need to be watching for signs of pain. What are some signs of pain that we might see? Grimacing. Grimacing, wincing. Tears. Tears. Oh, yeah. Tears are a big one. But you can also have resistance. You, The patient can turn their head away. Um, you can have, um, you know, kind of a stiffening up. Uh, all of those things are letting you know that the patient is uncomfortable in some way. Now, remember that we don't go past the point of pain. So if we're doing this, and I'll actually demonstrate on me today because I got a problem with my elbow today. It won't straighten all the way. So if it, if I bring, if somebody's doing range of motion and we bring my arm up and we try to go back all the way down, you're not going to get it all the way down because it's, it's not straightening today. So you get past that and I'm going to let you know it hurts. So I'm going to wince, I'm going to grimace, I'm going to do something to let you know that that is owie and I really don't want you to tear my tendon that right now is short, it's contracted. So you need to be watching your patient for signs of pain because it is that serious. If you've got a tendon that's contracting and you try to force that arm all the way down, you can tear the tendon. We don't wanna do that to the patient. Remember, we're not doing anything to make them better. We're just trying to maintain what they got. Maintain means stay the same. If you're tearing tendons, is that staying the same? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. So we have to have very clear expectations of what these exercises are for. Okay, make sense? Yeah. So here's our, <laughs> these are our checkpoints for this particular skill. We're gonna lift, let me go over here. We're gonna lift extremities from below with a flat palm. We already know that. We're gonna, Provide two points of support. We already know that. We're going to move slowly and smoothly. We already know that. We're going to return all the way to the start position. We already know that. Flexion extension is up, down. We've learned that. Abduction, adduction is side to side. We've learned that. And rotation is around. We already know that too. So there's nothing here. Nothing here to learn. All right, so let me get somebody to go lay down in that bed over there. And I will show you this. <laughs> Designated patient. <laughs> All right, I am going to simulate hand washing for the sake of time. Remember, after the first scale, the evaluator will tell you that you can simulate hand washing. Yeah. Hi, Ms. Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm fine. Great. Are you comfortable? You don't look comfortable. Okay. <laughs> Time out. Okay. See if that's better. A little bit. Go ahead and arrange that. Hello. Okay. All right. Let me start again. 
Hi, Miss Jones. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. How are you? I'm fine. Good. I need to do some exercises on your right elbow and wrist. Is that okay? That's fine. All right. I'm going to close your curtain. Let me go wash my hands and I'll be right back. I have clean hands. I've washed my hands. All right, Ms. Jones, I'm going to do all of the work here. All you have to do is let me know if there's any pain or discomfort as we do this, okay? First thing I'm going to do is bend your arm up and back down to the bed like you're making a muscle. So we're going to turn the hand palm up. You should be able to see this on the screen over there. Up and all the way back to the bed. Feel okay? Any pain? No. Okay. All right, we're going to go up and all the way back down. Feel all right? One more, up and all the way back down to the bed. Notice I'm supporting at the wrist and the elbow stays on the bed. Okay. Okay, so both joints are supported. Feel okay? All right, now we're gonna move on to the wrist. So we're gonna bring your arm up. Remember the elbow is staying on the bed. You don't wanna do this, right? Keep that elbow on the bed. So now I'm, we're gonna make a loose fist and I'm gonna bend your, your fist forward and back like we're rubbing a motorcycle. You should feel a little stretch. So forward and back, feel that stretch, feel okay? We're gonna go forward and back, still all right? And forward and back, still good? Awesome, are you comfortable? Yeah. Is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? No, I'm good. Okay, your environment is clean. Would you like a magazine before I go? No, thank you. Okay. And here is... <laughs> <laughs> Here's a call light. If you need anything at all, please let me know. I'm going to go wash my hands. I'll read that care plan one more time to make sure I worked on the correct body part, the correct joints, and the right number of um, repetitions. But I'm happy with my performance. So I would tell the evaluator my skill is done. Thank you. <laughs> Feel free to take a nap or. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of those days, that's good. <laughs> yeah. So, any questions on that? What do you think we should do if the patient says no? Report to this. Yeah, do we solve that problem? No. Find out why, that would be a good thing to do so that you've got that information for the nurse. Just find out why they're refusing. You know, maybe they don't feel good today. Maybe, I mean, if you came in and told me you needed to do range of motion on my left arm, I'm going to tell you no. And you're going to ask, can I ask why? And I'm going to say, yeah, my arm hurts today. And what would you do with that information? Mm -hmm. Oh, you're not going to arrange for a surgical console? It's a little Okay. So that's important, right? When they refuse, there's a reason. People don't generally refuse just to be mean or difficult. That's not what's going on here. If they're here, where do they want to be? Oh, home. You are standing between them and home. If they do what you want them to do, they think they're going to be able to get home quicker, mm -hmm. right? So people in a medical setting very rarely refuse for no reason. There's a reason behind that no. Now, the reason might be they've got something going on with them, right? Something that we need to report to the nurse. Or the reason could be it's an inconvenient time. They got family coming in or they have a test scheduled or something. But most commonly, the reason is because they're afraid or they've been injured by somebody else performing a skill. That's the most common reason that people refuse. They're afraid of what you're going to do or the person that did something before hurt them and they don't trust anybody. Those are two very, very important things to know. First of all, you can fix the they're afraid of you part. How do you think we could fix that? Okay, by being pleasant. Say it louder. Talk them through it. Talk them through it. Absolutely. Communication is key here. If I walked into that room and I didn't say a word to her and I picked up her arm and started moving it, she would be very resistant because she has no idea what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. Is it going to hurt? I don't know. 
But if you notice when I told her what I was going to do, I gave her real world examples that she was familiar with. I'm going to bend your arm up like you're making a muscle. Every seven-year-old boy knows how to make a muscle, right? This is something we're familiar with. I'm going to bend your, your fist forward like you're revving a motorcycle. Everybody knows what that motion is, right? These are example. And she's sitting there thinking, oh, that's not going to hurt. I, I can do that, right? Mm -hmm. So by, get, by communicating with the patient and giving them information, and assuring them that this isn't going to hurt. Please remember that in a clinical setting, every person that walks through that door hurts that patient in some way. Doctors perform very uncomfortable exams. Nurses bring needles, way more needles than we would like. And then we get catheters too. It's a whole nother issue, right? Billing, oh man, that really hurts. <laughs> EKG techs come in and stick sticky tabs all over you and then rip them off with every hair you never knew you had. Right? Mm -hmm. X-ray techs put you uh, in uncomfortable positions on hard surfaces. It's uncomfortable. Every person that walks in that room hurts that patient except for CNAs. Do you think your patient knows that? No. So when you walk in that room, what are they expecting? Okay. Yeah, they expect you to hurt them. We're the only people that don't. We're it. But your patient doesn't know that any more than you knew that three minutes ago. So when we go in, our demeanor needs to be calm and competent and caring. But communication is our very first skill with every patient. Explain to them what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it's going to be done. And this is a question I get a lot. Do I have to say everything you say when I'm doing the skill? And the answer is, well, there's no graded checkpoint that says, said everything Miss Patty says, <laughs> right? There's no checkpoint for that. But you are graded on how you make the patient feel. <clears throat> Remember, for the test, who is the evaluator focused on? The patient. The patient. They're not focused on you, are they? Mm -hmm. So if you can make that patient feel comfortable, that will reflect in your score. Mm -hmm. That's the very first thing I need you to understand for the clinical test. It has nothing to do with you. Not a single thing has everything to do with that care plan and that patient. You are just a person in scrubs. They don't care about you. They're looking at the care plan. Did the person in scrubs follow that? And they're looking at the patient. How did that person in scrubs make that person feel? That's their focus, not you. And if you can truly understand that, you will fly through the test. You really will. Okay. But the important part is don't forget that when you go out there. That's the really important part. Remember, this is somebody's family member. Trust me, when my mom's in the hospital, I am right there. And I don't hesitate to make sure that my mom is getting the very best care she can get. And everybody else deserves the same. Right? Good? Make sense? Mm -hmm. So we understand what to do if the patient says no. Some of the nurses don't care a bit. What's that? Some of the nurses don't care a bit. I, I you know, when I agree. Not, when my mom was in the hospital, one of her legs was amputated because she was diabetic. And when I went there, the first thing the nurse asked me, do you know how, I got music enough, do you know how to change their mom? And I said, I'm sorry. And she gave me two gloves. And when I went in there, when I draw the screen and went there, oh my God. They said they, she said they gave her some laxative thing when she's going to the theater and all of that. She was in all of that. And I stand and say, give me my scar. <laughs> but anyways, I put the gloves on. 
Yeah, I wish I could tell you that all the nurses were there for the right reasons. I can't. Any more than I can tell you that all servers at a restaurant are good servers or all cashiers at a, a grocery store are good cashiers. I'm sure that I'm ready with my system. I still will put, put, by a guy. Put, I mean, put, 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 put. It took the doctors about four hours um, to patch her up. And when the doctor removed her to the ward, sent the photos with her to the ward, while the nurse is tidy, when they look at her, they said, we can't do I said, we're going to do it. They gave me the basin and everything with the drug. They gave me a scissor and said, cut the tape from my body. And I did it all. I did it all by myself. Well, yeah. that are cold. All the blood drains in the, in, in the creases. It took me about two days to get it. And the nurses didn't do it. I did it. Yeah, and I, I did it to my mom too. They I told. wish I could tell you that, that, you know, that all the nurses are good. They're not. They're yeah. not, but some of you guys will go on to be nurses, yeah. right? And you will take the lessons that I'm teaching you into that higher that level how, of that care. I learned, you know, I look after a lot of old people in Jamaica. That is how I learned. Yeah, and I can't, I and can't go back and fix the ones that I are already out there. Mm -hmm. Bar, shave, I did everything, but they are at home. I was used to the hospital setting or the nursing home. They stayed at home and I did for them. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. That's, you have to know how to interact with them. Remember, healthcare systems are going to be a little bit different yeah. every place you go to. Yeah. And training standards are a little bit different in every place that you go. I walk Culture is a little bit I different. I in a valley. And her daughter used to come there, man, and go and learn some farm new parish. And one morning she decides she don't want it. And the doctor said, you have to drink it, that's what? You have to drink it. You have to drink it. And I said to her, no, she don't have to. And when she walked away, I spoke to the lady and I said, what would you like to eat today? She said, I need some curry chicken with a piece of yellow yam and some white bananas. I said, are you sure? She said, and I went to the shop and I bought it. And I come back and I took it. Mm -hmm. And I sat with her and I feed her and she eat it all her. So I said to the daughter, don't force her to drink the porridge. She don't feel for any porridge today, don't give it to her. Yeah. Yeah, so then you have to understand them. Have to like understand. I said, there, it, there's a cultural component yeah. to this. There's a training component. Yeah. That I, I can't, and your real world examples are very, um, they, they very impactful. Yeah. Um, especially with, you know, your, your experience, what you've seen and you're comparing yeah, the two. Yeah. Um, but remember that it's a different, everything is different. different. It's a different culture. It's a different system. It's different training. Everything is, is a little bit different. And I have no influence on what you experience. I can't fix any of that. All I can do is my part here in training you the right way to do it and make sure that you understand how important it is, not just for the test, but in a clinical setting, yeah. because that is somebody's family member and they deserve good quality care. And some of you will go on for nursing, which means you'll take these principles with you and we will eventually impact the nursing profession. So that's why I do what I do because there is a better way. And there's a lot of horrible stories out there in all cultures, right? There's a lot of horrible stories because unfortunately we work with people and people are all different, right? So there's some people that care very deeply. There's some people that are only there for the paycheck. Yeah. So, you know, all I can do is train and train the right way. And make sure these lessons are deep and they stick. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. That, that, I mean, it's a horrible, horrible story that, you know, they gave her a laxative and then nobody cleaned her up and left it for you. That's, that's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. But I will tell you that when my mom was in the hospital, I was the one that cleaned her, not because they wouldn't, 
but because she was more comfortable with me. And I have no problem with that. You know, that's, that's you know, I'm the daughter, mm -hmm. right? I didn't have a problem I'd rather me do it than a stranger. I didn't have a problem with the time. Yeah. I'm saying, suppose I didn't come at the moment. What did that happen to her? Right. Well, yeah. I mean, if I wasn't there, somebody else would have, you know, taken care of whatever she needed taken care of. So um, sometimes I will involve family members. Absolutely. Especially if I have somebody that's a little resistant to personal care. And I know that the family member is willing and eager to help. Yes, that is something that I can train a family member to do. Absolutely. If the, the patient is going to be more comfortable and the family member is willing. But it's not something that I would force upon somebody either. If you came in to visit your mom, I'm not going to hand you a washcloth and say, hey, go clean her. You know, it, it would have to be something that the patient's comfortable with and the family member is eager to do especially if this person is planning on going home where that family member will be involved in ongoing daily care yes. because they need to learn how to do that. So a, as a nurse, there's a lot of things that I'm going to think about when it comes to these issues. Yeah. Okay. They gave it a choose to spread, spread, to spread the bed and everything. Yeah. That's what really is. <laughs> All right, so page 54 is on the importance of practice. Um, um, being a CNA in that position, what I say, uh, hold on a second, I'm going to get the nurse and ask before you're able to do this on your relative. So, for instance, you walk into a patient's room, they have, they need to be changed, they need to be cleaned, and a family member standing there. Mm -hmm. It's not up to a CNA to delegate that. CNAs don't delegate. Okay. Your job is to clean. So if the family member expresses an interest, then um, you can say, well, go ahead and watch me this time and I'll let the nurse know that you're interested okay. in learning more. But you're still going to do the task you were assigned to do. That's a really big principle for um, the test is that CNAs do not delegate. If a nurse asks you to do a task, that is a one time, a, a single way transaction. So you can't then pass that task on to somebody else. Mm -hmm. If I ask you to do a task, you either do it or you tell me why it's not done. That's it, those, those are your only two options. Mm -hmm. You either do it or communicate with the nurse why it can't be done. If you come to me and say, hey, I can't do that for whatever reason, then I now can delegate it to you or I can do it myself, or I can train the family member. I have options, you do not. Um, and I know it sounds horrible, right? It really does. But it simplifies your job <laughs> tremendously because you only have two choices. You either do the task as assigned or you report back to the nurse. And that really simplifies everything from your point of view. But no, you can't um, hand the, the patient or the family member a washcloth and say, here you go, have fun. <laughs> Um, we can't, we're not allowed to delegate because there's a lot of things that you don't know that go into delegation, right? So my grandmother, one time she had fallen, she's in the hospital. She did, she messed herself and she called me at work and said, you need to come fix this. And I said, no, that work. You need to let them take care of it. Yeah. So that's so actually my grandmother. And she says, she's waiting for me. It's actually way more common than you would think. Um, a lot of people are very resistant to having a complete stranger in their personal area. Who knew? Yeah. Right? Who knew? <laughs> I would not be comfortable with a complete stranger in my personal area. Doing a very private um, task. Yeah. I mean, no matter how much it needs to be done, I am not going to be comfortable with a complete stranger in my personal state. I don't care how well-trained they are. That is not a comfortable place for me. Uh, it's not comfortable for me to call my daughter up either and say, hey, come help. <laughs> you know, that's not. But choices between the two? Yeah, my daughter's going to be a little bit, a little bit easier. I, at least I know her, right? I gave birth to her. She owes me. <laughs> you would think. Right? But it's it's a very, very common thing. 
No, the problem is it's not practical. It is not practical because when you're in there cleaning, remember what half of our job is? Observation and reporting. That is why you're here is to learn how to observe and what to report. It's not to learn how to clean somebody. She learned how to clean by somebody giving her gloves and washcloths and she figured it out. That's not what this class is about. The class is about observation and reporting. So if you're delegating this off to somebody else, they don't have that training. So we have now missed an opportunity to observe and report. And this is why training has to be done by the nurse, mm -hmm. delegation by the nurse. Because in that training, I'm actually going to be teaching the family member what I need them to observe for and what they need to report and who they need to report it to. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Remember, half of your job, we're only learning like the cleaning, <laughs> right? But remember, half of your job is the observation and reporting while you're cleaning. So if we have an untrained individual, they don't know all that, we're going to miss things. Mm -hmm. Is that, yes, like yeah, that. so even though it's very common for family members to not be comfortable with a complete stranger all up in their personal business, it's not comfortable. In a lot of ways, it is still necessary because there's things that we're doing while we're there cleaning that that family member just cannot accomplish effectively without training. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm there with my mom, but I also know what I'm looking for. Okay. I also know how to tell the difference between a normal BM, a BM from an impaction, a BM that indicates C. diff, a BM that indicates liver failure from the medications that she's on right? Color changes, consistently see changes, odor changes. And as CNA, you now know that you have to report all of those things. But somebody that's just a family member cleaning up a BM, they may not notice those things. Good? Make sense? Yeah. Remember, half of your job, observation and reporting. Don't lose sight of that. This, that's only half of what you do. That's what separates a certified nursing assistant from a caregiver. It's not this stuff. Caregivers can do all of this. Caregivers can do range of motion. Caregivers can clean people up. Caregivers can ambulate people. Caregivers can do all that. You could do all that as a friendly neighbor when your neighbor gets in trouble. You don't need a class to teach you how to brush somebody's teeth. You've got that down. Trust me, you could figure it out. That is a caregiver. Somebody is just helping somebody out with things that need to be done. That is not what makes a CNA. Observation and reporting, that's what separates you from caregivers. That's the difference. So that's how important it is. That is your role, observation and reporting. That's how important that is. Does that make sense? Did I explain that right? All right. So it, practice is important, guys. And part of the problem here is that if you're watching me, it looks pretty easy. You think you got it. You don't. Guarantee you, you don't. You got to practice it. You got to put the time in. I actually heard a quote that I absolutely love. I heard it yesterday and I'm, I wrote it down because it is awesome. It was a quote by Socrates. The things we need to learn how to do, we learn by doing. That's an amazing quote, right? You need to learn how to walk. How do you learn how to walk? You walk. You stand up on unsteady legs holding on to stuff. You kind of master that. Then you let go of the things and you fall on your butt. You get up and you try again. And then eventually you try to take a step. And eventually you let go and try to take a step and then you're off and running and you never sit back down, <laughs> right? But the things that we need to learn how to do, we learn by doing. So what does that mean for you in the skills? You gotta do them. You've got to do them. You have to do them. That's the one thing I can't make you do because you're adults. 
If you were kids, I could make you, right? But I can't make you do this because you're adults. I used to, when I first started teaching, I would give you a skill and make you get up and do it. I got a lot of bad reviews. People felt like they were put on the spot. They were being watched. They were unfairly judged. And people did not like that. So it's adult education. This is your responsibility. I can lead you to water. I can't make you drink. But remember that the things that we learn how to do, we learn by doing. Not by watching, not by reading, not by, you know, it's doing. Good? Got to practice it. Got to practice it. All right. We're going to go ahead and um, uh, one more thing, and then we're going to take a quick break. And uh, when we get back, we're going to go through the last three skills. So I want to talk to you about bed position. This is on page 104. This is super easy, super quick. And you can read this on your own. Beds have three positions. Or three ways of positioning, I should say. The head of the bed goes up and down on uh, clinical beds. The head of the bed goes up and down. The foot of the bed goes up and down. And the entire bed goes up and down. Okay, so three different ways of adjusting a clinical bed. Now, the head of the bed and the foot of the bed at the end of the scale, we don't care about. We do not care. If the patient wants to be sitting up, let them sit up, as long as care play doesn't say otherwise. If the patient wants to lay down, put the head of the bed down, as long as care plan doesn't say otherwise. If they want the, their feet elevated, put the feet up as long as the care plan is on. Yeah, care plan doesn't say otherwise, right? So that's just patient comfort, whatever they want. Sometimes they'll want to sit up and watch TV. Sometimes they'll want to lay down and take a nap. That's me. <laughs> right? But the entire bed, that is important. If you raise the entire bed up to a comfortable working height, you must lower it at the end of the skill. This is a critical testing step. Now, if you notice, not a single skill I have done, not a single one have I raised the bed up. Not a single one. It's not a requirement for any of the skills that you're going to learn how to do. But you can do it. it. It saves your back for sure. I'm short, so it's not really a big deal for me. But for those of you that are taller, it will save your back. Not a problem. Raise the bed up to dress the patient. Raise the bed up to do range of motion. Raise the bed up for any skill you want to do. I don't care. But the problem is that when you raise that bed up, what you've really done is move the floor. Okay. Yeah. Because when you get into bed at night and you swing your legs into bed and you go to sleep and you dream and you get out of bed in the morning, you're groggy. You swing your legs out of bed and that floor is always right where you left it. It's predictable. Yeah. You are groggy. You are not seeing straight. You are not thinking straight. You have not had any coffee yet. You swing your legs out of bed and the floor is always right where you left it. It's never moved a day in your life. You get into bed, you get out of bed, floor is right there. Now, when you raise that bed, you move the floor. That patient doesn't know it. They swing their legs out of bed and where is the floor? way far away from where they left it, but they don't expect that. So they put all of their weight down on a surface that does not exist. And what happens? Oh, they, fall. they fall. Yep. So the raising the bed to a comfortable height, knock yourself out, go right ahead, but do not forget to lower that bed to the lowest point. Not good enough, not I think that's all right, until the bed stops. Because that's where the floor was. It's just like when you treat a blind person. Sure. You absolutely. cannot change their room. No. Cannot. No. Everything has to remain it the same. The same. Mm -hmm. And if you bring because they have muscle memory. If you bring mm -hmm. something in you, you lead them to it. I have a blind hand that I used to look after. Mm -hmm. You have to lead her, lead her to it and say, I bring this chair here for you to sit on. It's on your right. 
Right, you're, you're yeah, going to occur. visually yes. explain oh, yeah. everything in their environment, yeah. anything that has changed. Yes. It's a leading area of it. You have a bump there. Yep. Lift it up to tell it to tie Yep. Yep. I had a blind one that I used to serve you. Yeah. All right, so does that make sense? Do you guys yeah. understand bed position? Yeah. Head of the bed has to be raised for things like mouth care, feeding patient, that type of thing, right? That's safety. But at the end of the skill, does it matter? Whatever the patient wants. If they want up, fine. If they want down, fine. I don't care. The entire bed, if you lift it up, does it matter at the end where it is? It must be all the way down. Okay, good. Questions? Let's take a break. Come back at 10 till. Okay, Esther, we are a test prep um, facility. It's for your CNA. We're located in Springfield, and we are just preparing you for the test. We are not a state licensed school. So our online program will not qualify you for testing if you've already failed three times. You must re, um, you know, go through another 120 hour program. All we're doing is, is reviewing the information to get you ready for the test or care people that are challenging the state exam. So um, if you failed three times, this is not going to uh, your qualification <laughs> for retesting. It's good information. You can certainly join, but it does not meet your qualification to make you eligible for the test. All right, we're on. I know it's hard to juggle everything. I know. You look so different today, you straighten the hair. Yeah, I have blown out. <laughs> It'll be back curly for the next time. <laughs> it only lasts a day or two. You definitely have a curly hair. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to go to the gym, so when I do that, yeah. I sweat and, you know, it all goes back to curls. Are you working in the um, healthcare industry already? Are I'm working? trying to get a job there. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been here from Jamaica? Since June. Oh, mm -hmm. I came um, in the end of May as well from New York. Okay. Never thought I would be in this profession. But I came in from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So you got your GD and all of that, or your high school uh, equivalency? In Jamaica? No, here. No. Just beginning. I'm just trying. 
But I was working at public before. Uh, <laughs> isn't it required to, to be a CNA to have that? No? If it's required? Yeah, to have a GED or a high school diploma before you could become before a CNA. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I don't think so. Chapters. I'm going to ask my daughter. You can ask her. She's a CNA. But she you can ask her here. Mm -hmm. Ooh, from um, she was small. Oh, so she chances are she have that. And she, she goes to school here and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, another friend of mine is trying to do it, mm -hmm. but when I looked it up, it says it's required. So oh. I told her unless she gets the GED, she mm -hmm. can't do it. I'm not sure. Then. I'll ask her. Yeah, you might want to check. Mm -hmm. You can ask the instructor. No, um, it wouldn't be because you could always go and get it. I mean, you could always go to school and get it. Mm -hmm. They have programs around here. I know someone that's taking one. Okay. Yeah. You, you did have a DVD? Me? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Uh -huh. That's how oh. I felt when I first came. Yeah, I, my body. Yeah, my body's still getting used to that. From the heat to the AC, whenever I get into AC, I just want to go on all the time. Yeah. Well, That's why I started chewing gum. Mm -hmm. and I put eye drops in, and now I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they're trying to get somebody to work in gym tonight. I'm like, oh, I didn't even check my thing. I'm working. I didn't get through. <laughs> I'm not actually get through. <laughs> I'll tell you. What are we going into next? I hope not, but. If nobody volunteers, I would. What do you work for? Uh, home instead. What is it? Home instead. Okay. I, uh, I, I think I'm still employed. I work for uh, Visiting Angel. Uh, I've worked once. <laughs> oh, hey, if you want hours, home instead's good. Because I told them that I'm doing the course mm -hmm. and I'll be done in a couple of weeks. So I guess they haven't given me any hours because of that. Which is nice. I'm so yeah. tired. <laughs> I'm not tired. Mm -hmm. I like I can't, them. You know, I can lie to them and say, no, I can't come and turn on yeah. the assignments, you know. I just told them I'm taking another course because the pay is nothing. No, it's I mean, not. I've never, I don't think I've ever in my life, even when I was 12 or 13 or when I started working, I've made more than what I'm making now. Mm -hmm. It's really New York, I've yeah. had it. Hmm? In New York, we have a higher rate of pain. Well, New York's mm -hmm. different. You don't make as much money in here. You have yeah. to pay a lot more, but yeah. everything is expensive. Everything yeah. is expensive. Yeah, the rent. Yeah. Yeah. The clothes, food, everything is very expensive in New yeah. York. Mainly pay. the rent. Mm -hmm. Mainly the rent. Mm -hmm. That's why I came. Yeah, that's true. I'm missing it, but you know. New York has a fast life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything. And never stop down, just like they say. Most of my Jamaican friends, they are in New York. They are saying, Why are you in Florida? I said, I love the school fees. That's that money. No, it's getting ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, Overpopulated. Yeah. Everything. Everybody wants to live in New York. I've lived there my whole life, but it's. You know, once once you've been there, done the things, mm -hmm. the touristy things or whatever, you don't want to be in that yeah. crowd if you, if you want to have a, a regular life with friends and family. Yeah, my kids yeah. say they could live in New York, but they don't like it. You go, after a while, you get sick of the hustle and bustle. Yeah, yeah. And they do. I, spent I, went, I went, spent one week. Mm -hmm. Since I came here, I spent one week in New York. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> that in Manhattan, everything is quite surprised. Mm -hmm. I was going to Tampa. Mm -hmm. I went to Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I went to the Statue of Liberty. So I go in the train ride. My God. Yeah, I don't miss that. Mm -hmm. I don't miss the trains. I used to take it every day to go to mm -hmm. In the summer, the scent, mm -hmm. it'll knock you Ooh. out. And the bicycles, they, they have some, oh, some people in the train, man. And it's bringing the bicycles and the distance. Oh my God. 
It's nice. It's and all those um Latin people on the road selling. Oh yeah. There's yeah. running down something here too. <laughs> Way down there. Bad it, bad it. It's good. It's good. The vendors. Mm -hmm. It used to be really, really bad in the 80s, every corner, but now you have to have a light. There's that, there's that place named Connell Street. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. You got everything. Chinatown. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that we went there. All right, guys. I hope I'm to... I went to Times Square in the night. My God. You're literally picking people. Mm -hmm. Like I said, for me, I did all of that mm -hmm. when I was 20. You know, fascinated by going to the city. We call it going to the city. You go to the city, you take it all in, blah, yeah. blah, blah. By the time, by the time I got engaged and got married and I wanted babies and I'm like, mm, that's not for me. I moved out to the island, which mm -hmm. is equivalent around here, where you drive everywhere. You can go yeah. to the beach uh, yeah. 15 minutes within my house, you know, go to restaurants. You don't have to wait the, an hour and a half or whatever, you know. I keep saying I wouldn't mind visiting, mm -hmm. but I don't know anymore. <laughs> but if you like the every half fast space and can do everything mm -hmm. at any time, mm -hmm. okay. then mm -hmm. yeah. the city Manhattan is for you. Mm -hmm. If not, you can live in Long Island and have a similar life to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're going to be paying a lot of money. It yeah. costs my monthly standard bills of living, mortgage. Well, um. Heating of my house, just standard stuff. It was about seven grand a month. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. compared to that, compared to where I am, it's like less than half. Yeah. So yeah, it was a lot. Is that Oakland? You would see this bag here in mm -hmm. Florida. You pay twenty dollars for it. When you go to New York, this bag is like for sixty dollars or something. Yeah. It depends on where you buy. Yeah, I went to the Indian shops. <laughs> if you buy it in Manhattan and the street vendors, yeah. you might pay a lot. Yeah, yeah. But if you go to Long Island and one of those stores, you might pay the same as you'll pay in Florida. Yeah. It all depends, yeah. shopping wise. It could be cheaper or more expensive. I went to the Indian shop. <laughs> Manhattan is a different ball game. But yeah. Queens, the other five boroughs, things are reasonable. You can, you know. Yeah. Who did? It, it, it's, you know, just the same as here. Mm. But I like the weather. Mm -hmm. I love cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I have cars right in here, but my body's still getting used to from heat to cold. I didn't really use AC much in New York. So, yeah. you know, I lived on the island. I was able to, at night, it's cool in the morning, it's cool. Open my windows, get all the cool air in. Yeah. And then close it up. Over here, you have to put the AC on, else you'll die. Yeah. But I don't look for that. Well, then, in Jamaica, would they like this? Yeah, but you don't have to use the heat. Hmm? I said, but down here, you hardly ever have to use the heat. Well, you guys, yeah. you guys are in the winter, you can't. Oh, yeah. Heat. But when the... it got really cold here a couple months ago, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I was the person walking out with the shorts. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what's wrong with you, Viva? Mm -hmm. And my sisters are like, this. But my body is still not adjusted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I'm native Floridian from Largo, little okay. south here. I got married. He took me to Iowa. Mm. Difference, big difference. Oh my! And May, there was still white stuff on the mm -hmm. ground. The only time I'd ever seen that was on a beach. You know? Wow. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was a shock. I love changing scenery. And New York, I was the first one. This snow of it. Huh? I haven't experienced this snow of it. Oh, oh it's glorious. Mm -hmm. I got lots of pictures if you want to see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one there in 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. Like now, my yard in New York, flowers everywhere. The best mm -hmm. yard, the first. Even here. Yeah. You know, I have flowers everywhere. Mm -hmm. I love to garden. There's a whole different ballgame over here. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to be doing much of that. Well, my friends are the master gardener. They have in Tampa. It's a little bit different. I was living in Tampa first. I just came here in December. I to spring in December. When I came from June, I was living in Tampa. I was a bit faster.
You're also in Spring Hill? I'm a, yeah, I've been in Spring Hill since um, 2010. Yes. So once the do decide to go to um, Pine Island, please tell me what else is there to do. I know. It's well, that. Okay, now I'm from Pine Island County and it's Pi, P-I, because not Pop. Not the way you back it, it's Pi. No. Anyway. Pine. Pinellas. No, Pinellas. Pinellas. P-I-N-E. Pine. Pinellas. Pine 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 okay. Pine. Everybody says Pine. Pine. Yeah, Pine. I say Pinellas as well. No, it's Pine. You can tell Pine. the people that grew up from a long line of people who grew up. So. Is there any Pine over there? <laughs> there used to be. Back, you know how up north they had, they slashed maples for syrup? Mm -hmm. Or in the south, they used to slash pine trees mm -hmm. for sap to make turpentine. Oh, wow. And some, some of my people used to have their wow their acreage where they would slash it from oh trust me so it got it got drummed in pine Alice. Wow. but um anyway so pine Alice is beautiful beaches i don't know if you've been down there but it's beautiful i haven't been to many places since i've been here i went Sugar to Sands. jenkins creek oh no it's um sugar sand so it's real fine white sand and uh, so then I come up here and someone says, oh, let's go to the beach. Completely different. Have you been to Hernando Beach? Mm, no, I've only been to Pine Island. Okay, well, Hernando Beach has less white sand than Pine Island. I'm like, <laughs> uh, basically what I was told is that they decided to make a beach, so they imported some sand and put it on top of the mud flat. Okay. Oh. Yeah, that's kind of me. Like, so it's a man made beach. Yeah. And it's not much of it. You don't go swimming, but oh. you can go fishing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they have a pier. You go out and go fishing. Oh. So, yeah. So I, I bring my, um, when my friends come up to visit, I take them to the beach. Mm -hmm. And then we laugh. But, but if you get a chance, and there's not, if you're into um, nature trails and stuff like that, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of wildlife. Around in some places you can go. Washing. Yeah. My daughter lives right there. Yeah. But I've yet to go because I've done so much damage to my skin over the years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was a sun worshiper. Yeah. This sort of like was my normal complexion. Yeah. Sort of like. But when I was younger in New York, mm -hmm. summer hit, I'm the one at the beach crack of dawn to dust. Yep. And over the years, more and more. And when I came here, I was just like, I just went in the sun a lot. And oh, I, yeah. you know, I was told my makeup to stay out oh, of the sun. sun. Well, my, um, I'm fair complexion. Mm -hmm. It has something to do with the Irish side. Mm -hmm. My sister is all complexion. Mm -hmm. So, you remember the day when you put baby oil? I did you, that because so did I you? was, you know, my sisters are brown. Mm -hmm. One of my sisters is brown as she is. So, I was always the fairest and, mm -hmm. you know, they made fun of me. So, I did the baby oil situation mm -hmm. to get that. So, I can, you yeah. know, blend more. Yeah, in the family. And, oh, um, my, my sister used to do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You yeah. want to fit in, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, she just loved the beach and the sun. I would go with her. Of course, I would go red, but I also loved when the wind picked up and I'm covered in that oil and I felt like a shirt. Mm -hmm. Because now I got a sand sticking cap. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she would love it. And she would, she would brown up. Me um, and I would blister. Nice. Yeah. Now I burn and uh, I don't get that nice. I was staring in the mirror for hours. I used to be a, a beautiful orange, like orange. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Because, you know, my home, my mother protect. Like, don't go in the sun. You're going to get, I didn't care. As soon as I got 16 and I was allowed to go places, I wanted to be tan like everybody else. And the first couple of days, you look amazing. Everybody's complimenting you, your skin and blah, blah, blah. Then after that, it just starts to peel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now it's permanent. You, you just know, I really to, did this on, you know. You just have to stay like a one. Mm -hmm. This is all burnt. In, in Jamaica, yeah. Mm -hmm. When you are like, when people are like your complexion, mm -hmm. oh my God, it was, you know. Mm -hmm. no, although we, we, we were born black, everybody mm -hmm. wants to be, to, to be white. Well, I'm, I'm very. They, they do a lot of bleaching. In Jamaica, they bleach and bleach such a list. You see the blue veins, blue oh, scores. Yeah. And then what happens when they have babies? The babies come out. I'm wondering why they are doing yeah. it. No, it's, yeah. I think it's, it's a West Indian culture. Yeah, they want to be, they fed. Yeah. 
if you are they said it said if you are white you're all right no <laughs> yeah and if you are black if you are brown stick yeah. around <laughs> i wish it was not huh? and i said if that was not i could talk more is it on? i think it is mm-hmm. mm-hmm. i don't think so surely she didn't put it on for no. It's still pretty. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm mixed. Yeah. I've got four different mm-hmm. races. Yeah. And there's dark, there's light, there's my mother, half black. Yeah. And the other half is Chinese and white. Mm-hmm. My father's 100% Indian. Ooh. You name it, I've got Chinese families, Hispanic family, Irish. There's Irish in me. I don't know from, I guess, from my mother's side. I have yeah. Caucasian, British, English. Mm-hmm. So it's every mixture you can think of. Yeah. So when you look at my family, you look at my daughter, my son, you'll be like, what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it is a white. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's why I go for my hair like this one day, and you'll see it in another day or two. It'll be back to curls and all over the place. In Jamaica, <laughs> we have white because. Mm-hmm. What happened? All the mixture from the the, the, yeah. the, 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 the plantation owners mm-hmm. were white. Mm-hmm. So what happened now? They got the slave woman, mm-hmm. the black slave woman mm-hmm. pregnant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you know you, you have a hair of Bob Marley? Mm-hmm. Of course. Bob Marley is white. You know why? I know about the culture. His a mother lot. was a black black woman mm-hmm. in Sinela, but his father was one of the plantation mm-hmm. owners. So you know what his kid? Mm-hmm. Yeah, high, high color. And he got us, you know, second woman as well. Yeah, and Rita is black. Yeah. But, but all the kids, you know, if they come in that. We're, we're hoping that this is uh, recording while we're sitting here. His jeans is very oh. strong. Uh, it's not, well, it is live stream. Yeah. 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 So and they hear then, all this conversation. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> you have people in Jamaica that is as white as you know. And you have yeah. in Jamaica. Yeah, we have a very mixed culture in Jamaica. Yeah. You have Chinese, you have Italian. I have mm-hmm. Thai. Mm-hmm. You see some people yeah. and they say they are from Jamaica and they are saying no. Yeah. But they are from because the white they come in, the Chinese come in, every type of oh, nation yeah. comes yeah. in and they got the, the, the black woman pregnant and we have a different race in Jamaica. But they have said out of many, one people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We have the two or just starting yeah. either way. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, questions before we get started? Any? No? I like that one just slowly going down. <laughs> yeah, I know. It, um, <laughs> these are a little, the older side is got a pneumatic cylinder in there. And the first stop is, it, it doesn't like, if you put any pressure on it, it's, <laughs> and then it, then that first part of the stop mm-hmm. kicks in. But. Please, do I have to have a GDD to become the CNA? I'm sorry? Does she need a GED to be a CNA? No, it's in Florida, as long as you are over 18, 18 years or older, you don't need a high school diploma or GED to get your CNA. Oh, okay. I thought you Oh, yeah, I was a bit confused. Yeah, as, as long as you're 18 or over, what they don't want are young women or young people. Mm-hmm. That really dated me there. <laughs> young people <laughs> to drop out of high school Okay. and get their CNA. Yeah. So if you're under 18, they require a high school diploma or CNA. Okay. Or uh, GED, sorry, GED. Uh-huh. to take the test. If you're 18 or over, they don't require any of that. Now, that means that you're, you're able to test, there, there's no issue, you're able to get certified, there's no issue, but there are some job positions and employ- employers that may have that as a condition of employment. So you'd have to look at each employer's requirements because as an employer, I can set any requirements I want for a position. Mm-hmm. You know, if I want to hire somebody for the store, I can say that I want them to have a master's degree in, you know, marketing and, and you know, whatever. I can set any Anything I want. I okay. yeah. Because I was inquiring as well. Hello. For a friend. That's 30, 30 years ago. Yeah. So you don't, yeah, you don't need a GED or a high school diploma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Life throws your curveballs. Sure it does. does. Yeah, it, it really does. does. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I you're gonna hear me say on the last day 
is make sure that you renew your CNA, even if you don't think that you're going to be using it. Make something yeah. I always tell my kids is always protect your ability to make more money. Mm -hmm. That should be number one on your list. And it, you know, as a CNA, you have the ability to make a higher wage than, you know, working at, you know, yes, just, you, do. Yeah. you know, a, a regular job. That's so right. make that's sure that you I mean, renew on time mm -hmm. to keep your CNA active. And I'm going to go over all the renewal requirements, how to renew the whole process on the last day. We're not going to get into it, but if you do have a lesson in your book, for those of you who want to work at, we will go over it on the last day. But protect, make sure you renew, protect your ability to make more money because you never know what's going to happen in your lifetime. Yeah. You, you just, you have no idea. And I, I know people that have let um, their nursing licenses expire because they're not currently working in nursing. And I'm like, you put all that time and money and, you know, everything into it and then you let it go. Oh my gosh, don't do that. Don't do that. Because then you end up coming and sitting back in my class to have to go through this whole process. I mean, the, the test is stressful enough once you don't want to do it again. You really don't. Once and done. <laughs> I know we want to get into it. So it's, not that obstinate. You have to renew. it's every two years, except for your first renewal. Mm -hmm. Your first renewal, you're joining it because so half of CNAs in Florida expire on even years. The other half of CNAs in Florida expire on odd years, and it has nothing to do with when you get certified. It has to do with your social security number. So you are going to be assigned a group, either A or B group. You have no control over it, and that group will expire on May 31st of either odd or even years. So you're joining a group already in progress. So your first renewal will not be a full two years. After that, It'll be every two years on either odd years or even years. We just have way too many CNAs in Florida to do it just more. It used to be on odd years. They changed about nine years to two groups just because I, Florida has a lot of CNAs, almost 200,000 CNAs. That's a whole lot to try to renew all on one day, you know, at one time. And yet the industry is so short-staffed. Oh, incredibly short-staffed. Yeah. Incredibly short-staffed. Uh, yeah, I, make sense. I am an advocate for better pay for CNAs. Yeah. I will tell you that all day long. I work very hard to elevate the profession. And that's, I mean, that, that you'll hear me talk about it. If you turn into my lives on Thursdays, you'll hear me talk about let's elevate the profession. Right, I'm a, a big advocate for that, but let me explain to you why. This is something most people don't really stop and think about. I think that if you work in medicine, anywhere in medicine, it should be mandatory $25 an hour minimum. Okay, that's that's my thought process. Now, unfortunately, the income that we get reimbursed from Medicare, which is the majority of healthcare is paid for by Medicare, Medicaid, or TRICARE, those government agencies. That's a, that's a whole nother issue, but you know, Americans don't want socialized medicine. They don't want a single payer of medicine, right? We've already got one. We've already got one. If you work in the government or you are over 65 or you're low income or you're disabled, you already have government sponsored insurance. Mm -hmm. And that takes up the majority of healthcare in America. The only people who can't access it are the ones that are paid for. And that'll make you think about it, right? Those are the only people that can access it. So the people that you'll find in healthcare, your patients, they're being paid for by government sponsored insurance because the rest of us can't afford to get sick because our deductibles are $9,000, right? So you don't find us in the hospital because we can't afford to go, right? So because the government is paying this, they pay at a lower rate, contracted rates, which reduces the amount of money that facilities have to put into employee wages, right? So, so there, there's a reason behind it, but let me give you something to think about for just a second. 
you've all seen those nurses out there that shouldn't be nurses. They have bad attitudes. They don't want to do patient care. They will sit at the desk and scroll through Amazon on their phone and not answer call. We've all seen those people, right? We've seen the bad attitudes. We've also seen the same from CNAs. The bad attitudes, the abuse, the neglect, all of those things, right? So when you raise wages to a significant level, when you make it attractive, you are going to attract the people that are there for the wages. Mm -hmm. You're not going to attract the people that are there for the heart. Mm -hmm. You're going to attract the people that are there for the wages. Mm -hmm. Now we've got a whole lot more of those people in this healthcare position. And that can be counterproductive. Does that make sense? I'm not saying that everybody would go, but you're going to get a whole lot more. I mean, guys, you're only sitting in a classroom for four weeks. It doesn't take a lot of time. It certainly doesn't take a lot of money. we got a whole bunch of people that are getting a free education right now, mm -hmm. right? Doesn't take a lot of time, and you can do it for no money. Mm -hmm. So who are they going to, if, if I'm paying $25 an hour, mm -hmm. yeah. who am I going to attract? Yeah, so again, I... Whoop. Not up here. Again, I'm an advocate for higher wages. Okay, I think that CNA should be paying what they're worth. No doubt about it. I think that $25 an hour is not unreasonable, right? Mm -hmm. But we have to be really, really careful there because unfortunately, I mean it, it's it's an it's an entry level position that doesn't take a lot of time or money to get into. So it's a little bit different than nursing. Nursing, if you want to be a nurse, you got to go to school for three years minimum to be a nurse. And then you've got student loans. Now you're stuck being a nurse, even if you don't like it. And those are the nurses that we see, right? Because they, they have to get that paycheck to pay those student loans. So they're stuck in a job that they hate because they incur debt to get the training to get that job, which they don't want anyway. So it's kind of a cycle. Now, CNAs, you don't need a student loan. You don't need years of your life. You can go to school for four weeks, take the test, become a CNA, and make $25 an hour. I will have a line out that door if, if they started paying $25 an hour. I would have a line out that door, but the majority of them will not be here because they really want to serve patients. And that's heartbreaking. It's absolutely heartbreaking for me because I understand that. And I advocate for better wages. But, and that's why I do what I do. Because these people are going to get their CNA regardless of whether I do this or not. They're gonna to go to a test prep that's gonna teach them skills and nothing more. They're gonna watch some videos, think they're a CNA, go take the test and they're gonna pass it and they're gonna become a CNA. And they don't have the heart or the compassion or the understanding of the care plan or any team building, or any of this other stuff that I'm giving you that's going to make you a good CNA. Not somebody that passes a test, a good CNA. So I have no control over that. They're going to get the education somewhere, at least this way. They're getting this other stuff too. With being CNA, like let's say after I am, after I get the certification, my plan on starting nursing classes. Mm -hmm. um, so, was somewhere within that three years, like, not saying I can move up, like, as a nurse, but is there a way that you can like, work in that field a little bit? What I would suggest is that you get your LPN first okay. and mm -hmm. then your RN. LPN is one year vocational. Okay. So, one year you're What's done. Vocation? It means you don't have to have pre reg, you don't have to have anatomy, and physiology, microbiology, all that other kind of stuff to get into the nursing program. It's just the entire program is included within the program. Okay. okay. Nursing, registered nursing, you got to do, it's a college level. So you've got to do anatomy, physiology, microbiology, nutrition, all these other prereqs before you get, even get into the nursing program, which is two years long. Mm -hmm. So it's a year of prereqs, two years of nursing. So if you do an LPN, and this is why I recommend LPN, okay? 
So you go into the LPN program and it's all economics. And I'm actually going to be talking about this on Thursday. Okay. If you tune into my live on Thursday, I'm actually going to show you the math. I don't have the ability to do that right here because I, on my lives, I do this, uh, well, and I have graphics on the screen, right? So it makes more economical sense. So first of all, the first benefit to LPN is that when you graduate in a year, one year, you're making way more money than you are as a CNA, yeah. right? $10 an hour, roughly, okay? So now you can work fewer hours for the same amount of time which gives you more hours to study, right? Mm -hmm. But it also, when you're going to our, it, it takes the place of the one year of RN school. So now instead of one year of prereqs and two years of RN school, you have one year of prereqs and one year of RN school. Okay, so it shortens the RN program. On top of that, so you get more money per hour, right? So you can work less, devote more time to school for the same amount of pay. It shortens your RN training. Remember, that's the expensive one, right? So you save money. But the third thing, and I think this is just as valuable, is because it's a vocational program, everything is included, you're going to learn about nutrition. You're going to learn about microbiology. You're going to learn about anatomy and physiology, not to the depth that you'll do in the college level, but it gives you a good foundation. So while all of these people over here are struggling with all of this really because you're doing all that at one time. Yeah. You're taking anatomy, physiology, microbiology, nutrition, all those classes all at the same time. And that's major time, major study, major brain power. And you're going to be done then. Right? So you've got, you've already got some of that behind you. <coughs> so it makes when you're going over here to the RN program a lot easier because you're now not trying to learn everything. Mm -hmm. Right, you're you're able to you have a taste of it. So on Thursday, you will go over all of that. Yeah, and also be able to make uh, suggestions of the school. That you well, I I don't normally suggest schools because my live is seen nationwide. But after classes, and yeah, well, here I, I I'll tell you here if I were to go, I did I went to elementary school, <laughs> mm -hmm. and if I were to do it again, I went to Inverness to with Lucucci. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a state school, so it's low cost. It's easy entry. Well, some places yeah. will reimburse you. Right, classes. some some places will. Um, so it, but it, it's it's not it because it's a small county. It's not as competitive. Um, if you go to a private school, you know, like we have one on Spring Hill Drive. If you go to a private school, it's three times the cost, and I mean, I went to it, but I, I, you know, I recommend what Gucci, I went to it. It was an excellent education. You know, I, I, I would absolutely recommend that. Okay. Yeah. And it's a little bit of a drive, but it's not horrible. Do you know the requirements to be in that program? Um, you have to go through an interview. You have to take the uh, T's test. Um, I think it, they changed the name of it, but it's an entry test just to make sure that you have good reading comprehension, Decent yeah, actually, the internet's been Tampa, and it was like a short little test, and then and they told me that I passed it, and so I'm moving forward. Oh, okay. Like, doing everything else, but I was like, oh, let me slow down a little bit because I was going to go for my DL. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was nice. Like holistic yeah. Doctor, and, but I was like, oh, let me just step back and let me actually go through like every process. Okay. You know I mean? So I'm unfamiliar with that. Um, yeah. So if you've already passed the test, that you know that will, and then you'll have an interview process. Basically, because it's competitive, right? They've only got, like here, I've got 12 chairs. How many students can I take? 12, right? Now, if I got 500 people standing at the door all wanting these 12 chairs, I got to have a way of narrowing it down. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that the 12 people I pick are ones that are likely to be able to complete the program, mm -hmm. right? To learn effectively. So if you have no reading comprehension skills, you're probably not going to be successful. No. So they're looking, that's where the interview process comes in, the testing comes in, all of that. They just want to make sure that they're finding people who have the best chance of success. Yeah. yeah. And so, they actually still call. They still try to get me to do it. Really? Yeah. 
Yeah, and it, it's I I absolutely um, recommend doing LPN and then RN. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, for all the reasons I just all of them. <laughs> you had something? Uh, when you were talking about uh, people in care, I worked in a dementia unit for ten years. Dementia requires a different type of mindset. Uh -huh. You really have to be compassionate. But I've seen, I can't tell you how. And to me, if like it was an ALS. So to me, the dementia staff should have been paid more than regular because you have more challenges. But we had people, I know one lady, with, one girl said um, she's supposed to give a shower. So what she does is she takes the, and she has to tell people about that. And she'll take them to their room for 30 minutes while she's on her phone. And then when she gets done, she just sprinkles some water on their hair. Well, and says, she should be and she, you got a catcher, you got a management catcher. You got a catcher, you got, you know, there's a whole lot, it's a lot easier to hire than it is to get rid of. It. Oh, there is, yeah. And you get stuck, I mean, you have to have a rule where you have to see somebody punch somebody before you can get rid of them. And, you know, and, and that, how many times did you not catch? If she had not bragged about it to somebody, none of us would have known. Mm -hmm. So that is off. But again, off. because you paid a little bit more money than McDonald's at the time. Then you know that's why she was there, and she could care less about these people. Yeah, so. be on the hearing the room. Yeah, especially oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's for me, it, it truly is just heartbreaking what a lot of patients have to do. Oh, yeah. We had it's just you know it, it, people would just step outside of themselves for five minutes. Mm -hmm and see what this person has had to experience mm -hmm. just to get in this place. Well, that's like, we had a gentleman, he had been through the war, okay? So you know what he went through there. So um, one of the girls put him on a toilet, forgot about him. <laughs> and when they came back, he's on the floor. Well- No surprise there. <laughs> and, I, and I came in and it was like, I wanted to kill them all. Yeah. Like that sort of mouth because I <laughs> So here's a situation that I'm facing at the moment. This actually just came up yesterday. So my mom's very, very dear friend lives in Gainesville. Her husband passed away two years ago. Suddenly, heart attack. She lives on a farm. She's got a great neighbor support system. There's like six families that live in this one little neighborhood and they all take care of each other. She doesn't drive. So her neighbors take her where she needs to go. They do a great job with her. But it's getting to the point now that it's really getting hard to coordinate the amount of care that she needs. And she has diabetes and uh, she's in her 80s, but still very, you know, very with it, very active. There's nothing wrong with her mentally. Um, but she is aging right? And she had just told my mom that I think I'm going to go ahead and sell the farm and move up to New York with my daughter. And now my mom knows, you know, oh my gosh, she's not going to be able to tolerate the cold, right? You know, all the things yeah, that we yeah. talked about, right? And um, she's, but she's supporting her friend. She's sad that her friend is going to be going <laughs> out of state and she knows she probably won't be able to see her anymore other than FaceTime, you know, but there won't be any visits. And so all of that happened last week. So I'm just painting a background for you. That all happened last week. So big changes on the horizon, right? Well, in the meantime, after all that happened, a day or two later, she ends up in the hospital because she doesn't have good circulation to her feet. Now she's lost most of one foot, the right foot, all the toes, most of the foot, yeah. but she's able to kind of walk where she needs to walk. Well, this time in the hospital, she lost circulation to her other foot completely. They had to handle it. Mm -hmm. So my mom called the neighbor. How is she doing? She's out of surgery. She's in ICU. Everything is good. Um, she's recovering. Okay. And mom's like, oh, well, you know, it's probably a good thing she's going to her daughter's now. And the neighbor said, well, the daughter is now talking about putting her in a home. 
And my mom immediately said, no. She will come here before she goes to work. So this is, we need to understand this is the, this is the reputation out there. Mm -hmm. Can we change that? Sure, it's going to take time, but I have faith that we can change the system. I have faith. You have partners that do that to get out of you. But I, yeah, but I, I used to look at them and in Jamaica. No matter how his wife is there, he will take the phone and call She can If he wants to rub somewhere in pain, she can't do it. If he needs pills, she can't do it. Yeah. She can't do it enough. He wants to bathe, she can't do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But me, yeah. I not, she just don't want to do anything for him. Okay. Well, but, but that's a very specific, I'm talking more general, yeah. right? So what I'm saying is that, can you imagine this woman now? And, and that's what I'm trying to get to. Can you imagine this woman now? Mm -hmm. She's lost her husband. Mm -hmm. She's lost her home. Mm -hmm. She's lost her legs. Mm -hmm. She's lost her independence. And she was planning on going her, to her daughters. And now she was put in a home. Yeah. Can you imagine her mental mm -hmm. state? when she gets there. She is gonna feel abandoned, hopeless, helpless. And these are the patients that we take care of every day. Mm -hmm. This is their reality. And that's what it just, if, if the caregivers could just get outside of their own head for five minutes and see that, then we could work on compassion. Mm -hmm. But instead they see, oh, another woman that I have to bathe. They make it about them. And the more we pay, the more of that we're going to attract. You messed yourself again. I just changed it. Exactly. Yeah. No. They don't live now. No. no so we've got to do better. We can do better. I firmly believe that as a society, we can get better. And that's one of the things that I do on Thursdays is try to make sure that I'm encouraging the people that are out there working. It's, you know, there's nobody there that's giving you guys emotional support. You're supporting the patients, but who's filling your cup up? Mm -hmm. And that's my role on Thursdays, is I try to make sure that I'm providing inspiration and drive and compassion so that you guys don't get burned out as well. So, uh, you know, if you have a chance, especially after you're certified, make sure you're tuning into those Thursdays because that's what it's all about is supporting you guys, okay? So let's get into the rest of the lessons today. <laughs> so let's go to page 68. So this is denture care. Our care plan here says a resident with dentures is sitting at an overbed table with their dentures in a denture cup. Well, that sounds easy enough. They're sitting down, dentures are already out of their mouth and in a cup. The resident's denture needs to be brushed with toothpaste and the resident needs mouth care. The denture is stored in a denture cup after cleaning. Let's stop there for a second. Now let me explain to you why this is important. If you look at the bottom of the page here, you'll see that this is being done on the live testing student. You might be the patient for denture care. You probably do not have dentures. So nobody needs to be forcing dentures into your mouth. So what does care plan say? Where are they? The Where are the dentures put? In the, cup. In the cup. Follow the care plan. <laughs> right? That's why this care plan is set up very specifically. At the beginning of the skill, the dentures are in the cup. You're not going to take them out of their mouth. In fact, in a clinical setting, you should not be taking dentures out of anybody's mouth. You should not be pulling or pushing dentures into somebody's mouth either. So let me explain to you why. That's not a CNA job. That's a patient job. If the patient can't do it, we puree their food. We chop it up. But if you, okay, if I have dentures in, let's say that I have dentures and I want to remove my dentures. I'm going to put my fingers way back here, like inside my mouth, right? Way back here. And I am going to pop the top dentures down. 
Well, that's okay because my top palette is attached to my skull. That's all right. But when I get down here to the bottom ones, this is not attached. This mandible right here, it's attached by tendons. It is not attached by bone. So when you try to take out these bottom dentures and you get your fingers way back here, you've got to pop them up. In order to pop them up, you have to counter pressure down. So your knuckles, when you put your, your hands in somebody else's mouth, your knuckles push down on that lower jaw. And it's very easy to dislocate that lower jaw, or at the very least, to cause TMJ, because you're at a different angle than the patient if they were to take their own out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We do not take dentures out, not our job. If the patient can't take their own dentures out, they don't use them. We just puree their food. We got, a, we got a solution for that. So as a CNA, how would you know which what to do? Care plan. Follow the care plan. You don't have to come up with this information. You don't have to think about it. It's going to tell you what to do. So just do that. Right? But we also don't put dentures in. Now, you can put dentures in somebody's body. You can just pop them in there. But when you do that, your hands are in there because you're putting the dentures in, trying to get them, you know, in the right place. And they will unconsciously, without being aware of it, bite down to see those dentures. Where are your fingers? In their mouth. And you will get bit. You will. Not because they're trying to hurt you. Not. It's an unconscious reaction. They bite down to seat the dentures. They're not expecting a finger to be in the way. So you will get bit. Not on purpose. So our role here is to clean the dentures, have them available for the patients when they want to put them in and take them out. But we don't do the putting in and taking out. <coughs> Good? Okay. All right. It says a resident is not able to provide their own mouth or denture care. That's fine. But I want to go back to the second line. It says the resident's denture needs to be brushed with toothpaste. Let's stop there for just a second. Because, man, is this important. In most cases, most cases, your patient, when they get their dentures made, they're going to receive very specific instructions from the people that make the dentures. And there are some dentures that you should not be brushing with toothpaste because toothpaste is abrasive. And, you know, our teeth are kind of living material, right? So if we can brush it with abrasive stuff because our body can repair itself. Dentures, not living material. When you brush that with an ab abrasive toothpaste, you can actually cause micro cracks to form, which allows, it, it's a warm, dark, moist environment. What grows there? Okay. All the bad stuff. Yeah, all of it. So we only brush dentures with toothpaste if the care plan tells us to. The rest of the time, we put them in a denture cup with fizzy tablets. Let the fizzy tablets do the work and just take a soft brush and get off any particles that might exist. How do we know which is which? Follow the care plan. Starting to see a theme in this class. Yeah. All right. So this patient sitting at a chair or in a chair at an overbed table, dentures are already in a cup. Dentures have to be brushed with toothpaste. After we brush the dentures with toothpaste, we'll put the dentures back in the cup and in a place where the patient can access them later. They can't do any of this. We're going to do it all. And we're also going to brush the mouth the dentures came out of using mouth care. Sound fair? Okay. So not hard. Kind of long. When you look at the time on this, it's 13 minutes. It's like kind of a long still, but not hard. Let me explain to you a couple of things with dentures. Most people don't have dentures at home that you can practice with. So this is a skill that I highly recommend you come in here and practice because I have dentures. But I also have a mom. 
I love my mom. <laughs> she is awesome. I mean, when I ask my mom to help me with something, she helps me. And she works with resin, right? So resin is uh, um, stuff that gets really hard when it's combined with other materials, right? So I asked her, hey, mom, can you make some dentures? And we bought a denture mold. Amazon sells everything. <laughs> everything. And she's been making me dentures for students to be able to buy to practice. Oh, wow. And they are, you can't really use them. And I mean, they're not like made for people, right? Mm -hmm. But they look like they are. They are, they, they're seriously a good practice tool. Now, I'm supposed to get those from her this next week. Yeah. She's got a hundred of them that she has made of. So if you need dentures to practice with, I'll have them available for you to purchase. I don't know. I think that we're probably going to, I'm not real sure. I, I, I've got to find out how much she's got into them, right? But if you come in here and have this, I've got them right here for free. Just don't take them. <laughs> right? But they are here for you to practice. Now, she really is awesome. I do love her a lot. You know, I'm a daughter, so she drives me crazy a lot, but you know. <laughs> But her mom drove her crazy too. <laughs> All right, so you cannot touch dentures without gloves. You cannot touch a denture cup without gloves. That's okay. But you can't touch dentures without gloves. Let me show you what a denture looks like. Now, most of us, when we think of dentures, we think of this. This is a full plate. Right. When we think about dentures, this is what we think about. This is a moment. This is a top plate. I know this has got a palate or the part that goes on the upper roof of the mouth. But this is a whole plate. That means all the teeth are present and accounted for. Mm -hmm. We pulled all of the patient's teeth and gave them false ones. Mm -hmm. This is not the only type of denture, though. You also have partials. Now, a partial, this is a bottom plate. But a partial looks like this. It has some teeth on it, but it also has some cutouts for the patient's remaining teeth. Because if a patient still has healthy teeth, we're not gonna pull them just to pull them, right? We're gonna work around them. So we have full plates and we have partials. There's also bridges. Bridges are little pieces of denture and they can be permanently affixed or they may be able to pop out. Make sense? Good. We're going to treat them all the same way. But it is important that you understand there are differences in dentures. Now, there's another type of denture that we have to talk about, though, and that's called an implant. Implants are a little bit different. They are dentures for the sake of the word because they do replace natural teeth with an artificial chewing surface. That's what a denture is but they are different in that these come out and get cleaned. Implants actually snap onto posts and they don't necessarily come out. For, there are many implants that can come out, but for the most part, once they're in, they're in. And then the um, dental hygienist will do the cleaning every so often. Good, make sense? Dentures have to be stored in water. If you notice, there's water. They have to be stored in water. Do not have dentures just kind of laying out without water because those dentures have to, if they're not in liquid, they're going to dry out, become brittle. And in order to maintain the flexibility and the, the, um, the mold, we want them in water. Good. But the water needs to be clean. And when we're cleaning dentures, we're going to use cool water, not hot, not cold, just cool water. There's a principle here that says that um, teeth <coughs> coagulates protein, which means nothing if you're not a chemist. But what it means to us is that, remember that you've got protein in your saliva, protein in food, protein in the denture paste that holds the dentures in, like there's protein everywhere. And if heat 
makes those protein molecules stickier, they're going to be harder to remove. So if you're using hot water, it's actually going to be harder to get all of the pathogens off of the dentures. So cool water is what we're looking for. Now, when we take this cup, so we're going to do our opening. Hi, not, not, not. My name is Patty. I'm your CNA today. I'm here to do this, all that, right? Close curtain. We're going to take, once we do that opening and we're going to go over to the sink and wash our hands, we want to take the cup with us. Remember, you don't have to have gloves to touch a cup. You're going to take the cup over and leave it at the sink, wash your hands, get your supplies, and all of that. It's going to be over there, ready and waiting for you. When you get over there to actually start brushing, you don't want that sink to be bare because if you drop it, remember, they're full of saliva, food particles, toothpaste, right? They're slippery little boogers. If that thing falls and hits the bottom of the sink, it's like likely to break. So if you take a washcloth and put it in the bottom of the sink, it'll provide a softer surface. Bonus, if you get it over the drain. Because if you put the washcloth over the drain, it slows the water from being able to leave and it'll pull that water up. So now if the dentures fall, they get water, which isn't gonna hurt them a bit. Good. Okay, so we're going to have two different brushes for this. This is a denture brush. It's a double-sided toothbrush. This end here, we use on, it looks like a toothbrush. So we use it on the teeth part. This end is smaller. It fits in the channel for the part that goes over the gums. So this part for the channel, this part for the teeth. This is a tooth that we're going to use this on the patient on the gums. And that's because dentures are held in by denture paste, which is stringy, gummy, sticky. If you try to clean denture paste up with the brush and you're not at the sink to rinse it out frequently, that paste is going to get all gummed up in those bristles and it's not going to be overly effective. Remember, your patient is sitting over here. They're not standing at the sink. So this is a solid surface. It's squishy, but it's solid. That's the point. Because when you're using this, it helps swipe away that denture paste and cleans the gums. And it's soft, so it doesn't really hurt. It also has four distinct sides. So you can swipe. And if it gets all gummed up with denture paste, you can turn it a quarter turn. And now you've got a clean surface to work with. Good. Questions? Pretty cool, right? Go ahead and take a look. All right, I'm going to show you the video for this one. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Let's go over the test specific. Oh, all right. See, I have on screen graphic. <laughs> so your patient is sitting at a chair. Uh, remember that you need gloves on to touch the dentures. There's three different types of dentures, full plate, partial, bridges. So here's our testing checkpoints for this particular skill. We want to put the washcloth in the sink. We're going to use cool water. We're going to store the dentures in clean water. When you get done washing the dentures, you want to rinse that cup out and fill it up with cool, clean water, put the dentures in it. And now we're ready to put it on the table for the patient to use anytime they want to, but that cup is wet. If you put a wet cup on a surface, what do you think is going to happen to that surface over time? Yeah, it ends up warping it, leaving a ring, and housekeeping is going to yell at you because you're ruining their furniture. So we want to put a coaster underneath, which is nothing more than paper towel. It's just something to soak up that water and try to prevent it from ruining the furniture. When we're doing the mess here, patient has to be sitting fully upright. We're going to protect the clothing. We're going to brush all surfaces. We're going to wet the brushes before we apply the toothpaste, just like hands, right? Remember I said we had to wet our hands before we put soap on yeah. so that the soap spread around? Same thing, you want to wet the brush before you put the toothpaste on so that it spreads around. We want to allow the patient to rinse and spit, well, duh. 
and we're going to leave the patient's face and clothing dry at the end of the skill. I would want that. You would want that. The patient definitely wants that. So we'll do that. Okay. Let me show you this particular skill. I'm going to show you the um, video for this one because it does have good close-ups, and that's important. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jones. I'm going to place the barrier on the table so we have a clean area to place the clean supplies. And then I'll gather the supplies in my We'll need a cup of water, a tubette, a denture brush, toothpaste, a basin, a washcloth, and a towel, and two sets of gloves. Okay, we're going to get the denture brush ready for use, so I'll wet it. And apply a little bit of toothpaste to both sides. We'll allow the basin to hold that denture brush until we're ready to use it. I'll be right back, Mr. Jones. I'm going to go clean your dentures. Okay. Okay, Mr. Jennifer, I'm just going to set your dentures over here so that you have them. You should take them later. Okay. I'll place the denture brush on the barrier and now we'll remove these gloves. We'll throw those away. 
be lined by place of power in your chest. So for you. So how can you go in the We're going to prepare for the mouth care portion of this skill. We'll take the toothpick and wet it. Apply a little bit of toothpaste to one area of the toothpick and apply gloves. Okay, Mr. Dennis, I'm going to brush all surfaces of your teeth now. So in a moment, I'll need you to open your mouth wide so that I can reach the back teeth. Okay. Okay, can you open your mouth? Thank you. I'm going to brush the back on the bottom and on the top, both sides. Okay, can you bring your teeth together, please? Thank you very much. We're going to throw the tooth out of legs. <clears throat> Would you like to rinse? Good. Would you like another rinse? <laughs> another rinse? Okay. I'm going to remove yours out. And we'll place this in dirty linen. We'll throw away the disposables. And now I'm going to clean your basin. I'll be right back. Place the ginger brush and the toothpaste in the basin and open the drawer with the paper towel. Store the basin in the loose compartments. I'll remove the barrier from the table and we'll throw this away as well. Now I can remove my gloves. Mr. Jones, are you comfortable? Yes, ma'am. Can I get you a magazine? Perfect. Is there anything else that you need? Nothing. Your call light's right there. If you should need anything, just let me know. I'm going to open your curtain and go walk my <laughs> After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. Okay. All right. Any questions on that one? Mm -hmm. you, when you get the glass of water, it kind of magically appeared. Where did you get the glass? Of Good question. Oh, it did magically appear, didn't it? Yeah, the magic of Hollywood. Yeah. For the exam, they will have a glass of water on the bedside table for you. Okay. Um, not all testing centers have drinkable water from the tap. So they, that's why it's not a testing um, checkpoint to go get water from the tap. Okay. Because not all, you know, you know. So for the test, the evaluators actually have a pitcher of water or a bottle of water that they will make sure that you have a cup of water for water skills. Great question. <laughs> yeah, I actually need to do a video on that. I'm glad you... My make a note for me, um, please. Uh, water during testing, just put it in Slack. Water during testing, and make a note for Thursday on LPM. <laughs> I got so much going on right now. I told you guys about the quiz show, quiz show right? Mm -hmm. Did I tell you about the quiz show? No, 
Um, I'm hoping to start it this month. I'm still trying to get all of the tech together, but I'm going to have a question. I don't know exactly what day it's going to be, but it's going to be written test questions and it's on YouTube, but it's interactive. So it, it is the coolest program I have ever seen. It's amazing. So when you join YouTube, like it's live like this, so like my people at home right now, if I had this program running, they would be able to see me, hear me live, just like, you know, I'm in front of you. I would ask a question that would show up on the screen and then they would in the chat type in A, B, C, or D, right? For the question, answer question. The program actually reads those, tallies it up and puts it on a leaderboard. And they keeps track of points as the, the game is being played. So at the end of the game, you know, if we do 30 questions or 60 questions or whatever, at the end of the game, I can see who's got how many points and then I can give prizes. Okay. We're actually going to be having prizes. Oh, yeah, dentures. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so it's, um, it's going to be really, really fun, but it's a way for you guys to practice for the written test. And I'm hoping to have that ready to go by the end of the month. I'm still working on learning the program and getting it set up right. There's a lot of tech in the background and I'm tech challenged. Um, I mean, all of this took me a long time to put together. This is this is pretty, you know, being able to switch cameras and views and rotate, that, that's pretty big tech. Um, but I do everything in-house. So I run all of our own websites. I do. I mean, I develop them like on the server. I write code. I do WordPress. I mean, I do all of that on the back end. All of these graphics that you see, everything you see here, this, these, this guy, I drew all of those. I do all of our artwork. So everything that we produce is done here in house. But man, that's a lot of tech to learn. <laughs> and now I got a whole nother program I got to master. <laughs> but I'm hoping to have it up and running by the end of the month. So if you have a chance before you test, make sure you tune into the game show. And like I said, I'm going to have some really, uh, really cute prizes to give away as well. All right. Any other questions on that? We good? Let's move on to ambulate with a gate belt. It's on page 46. Spend too much time talking today. All right, care plan for ambulate with a resident using a gate belt on page 46 instructs us to ambulate the resident at least 10 steps. Use a gate belt or transfer belt. Patient will be sitting in a chair at the side of the bed with shoes on. Patient is able to walk, but needs assistance to stand. Good. Mm -hmm. Pretty self-explanatory. How far are we walking the patient? At least 10 feet. Yeah, at least 10 steps. Now that's steps. five in one direction and five back. Remember, it's return trip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this isn't very far. And the, in fact, the evaluators will probably give you a destination. They'll probably say, walk to the white table and back, walk to the bookcase and back. They'll give you kind of a, a destination, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the reason for that, I told you they don't throw you curveballs on the test. Do you remember me saying that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This skill, they throw you a curveball. Now, I'm going to tell you about it, so it's not a curveball to you. But at the beginning of this skill, when they're getting everything set up, so let's say you're going to be the patient for this. I would ask you to come sit in the chair, make sure that you had good fitting shoes on. And I'm gonna tell you, um, you can walk, walk like you walk. Don't walk like a 90 year old invalid, right? Be you, okay? Um, and once I've got you sitting in the chair and I know, you know how far I'm gonna tell you to walk, I'm gonna move a table or some other obstacle in the path. And then you, are now going to do the skill. And your job, I'm gonna tell you, walk to the white table and back. Your job is to look and see that table. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. They wanna make sure you move that table before you stand the patient up. Mm -hmm. Why would that be important? 
Yeah, it's kind of common sense, isn't it? But it's, it's yeah, it's because it is a hazard. And if you are paying attention to the hazard and trying to, to get your patient around it, navigate around it, you're not paying attention to the patient. Who should we be pay, paying attention to? Yeah, so a checkpoint is to make sure that the um, walkway is clear of obstacles before you stand the patient up. And because they couldn't just, if you, if there was no obstacle, right? And you just looked and saw there were no obstacles. There's no way to prove that you made sure that the pathway was clear of obstacles. Just by look, you know, they can't hear you look. <laughs> Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's why they put something in your way is so that you have to address it. Clear? Yes. Okay. So that is a very important checkpoint, making sure that the walkway is free of obstacles. All right. So let me explain to you what's important about this skill. We're going to go back two pages, or three, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to page 43. Everything I'm about to tell you is on page 43. I'm going to sneak past you here real quick. Just need to put this down just a little bit. There we go. This chair out of the way. This chair is over. Okay, I think we can work with that one. All right, so. Everybody can see that, right? Yeah. Okay. That's going to be important when we talk about body mechanics in just a minute. Right now, I want to talk to you about energy conservation and why this is important. Have you ever seen an older person try to get up out of a chair? Yeah. Right? They, they do this. They start to rock. Yeah. Right? And then they, once they get up a little bit of momentum, they, no, 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 no. <laughs> Then they start rocking again. And then. <sighs> How much energy did that take? Oh, my gosh. If I had just stood up, right, that didn't take nearly as much energy as it took to do the whole rocking and trying and failing and rocking and right. That takes a lot of energy. Well, why do we care? Uh, I got to sit down because they can't see me now. <laughs> Why do we care? Well, we care because part of what we have to do in CNA is, is help the patients manage their energy. Now, this is hard for you to understand if I don't explain it. Have you ever seen a two-year-old? Yes. <laughs> How much energy does a two-year-old have? Too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you like that energy? Yes. Oh man, if I could bottle that, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> right? So here's the problem. Explain to that two-year-old why you don't have their energy. Mm -hmm. No, get them to understand it. Yeah. yeah. Why? Because it won't stay still on <laughs> there. They never experienced it. All they've experienced is the amount of energy they have, and they assume that because they've got it. Yeah, everybody's got it right you can't get them to understand that because it's out of their comprehension they never experienced it that is you you are right now the two-year-old because i'm going to tell you that that 80 year old doesn't have energy and you're not going to be able to comprehend it because you it's out of your realm of experience okay so in this situation you are the two-year-old i can't get this embedded in you so i've got to find a way around it so that's what we're going to talk about now is energy conservation i'm going to try to put this in terms you understand so two-year-olds man they'll bounce up and down for no reason but they don't have to have a reason they just have energy so they will bounce when's the last time you bounced for no reason probably when i was two Mm -hmm. Right. If I win the lottery, I'm bouncing. <laughs> but I got a reason, right? That's I, I got energy because now I'm like 
hyped up, right? Mm -hmm. But outside of that, I'm not bouncing. <laughs> it's just not gonna happen. So at two, we have, in fact, your energy levels peak at two. <clears throat> you probably didn't realize that, but they do, they peak at two. We have boundless energy because it's the, the period of time of rapid growth. The most rapid growth you'll ever experience in your life happens at this time frame. But your energy level doesn't stay high like that. It actually decreases pretty quickly. Let's go up to 12, right? 12 year olds still have tons of energy. I love 12 year olds. They're awesome. They're like right on the brink. I love 12 year olds. They can be sassy, right? But they're cool. But you put that 12 year old in charge of that two year old from one <laughs> afternoon who went two, two year old. 12 year old's like, hey, can you get him to take a nap or something? Because I'm done. You know, I'm ready to go play video games now, mm -hmm. right? Your energy level has fallen between two and 12. Now let's go out to 22. 22 year olds still have tons of energy, right? You can shop till you drop and they go out at night looking fabulous, yes. right? Still tons of energy, but you do not have the same energy level you had when you were 12. Let's go out to 42. 42 year olds are shopping till they drop, but that's at like three and we're not going out. <laughs> Done. Let's go out to 62. 62, our energy levels have fallen even further. We're thinking about retirement now because there's just not enough energy to get through all the daily activities and the household chores. So we're looking at maybe cutting back on work or retiring. We might be putting our feet up for 10 minutes before we make dinner, right? We're making concessions because our energy levels have fallen even further. What do you think they're gonna be like at 82? <laughs> Barely there. Okay, so what do we do every day? What does an 82 year old do every day that they need energy for? Just do it. Drink up and go to the bathroom. Okay, yeah, bathrooms take a lot of energy, right? Just standing up. Look how much energy it took me to stand up, right? Standing up, getting to the bathroom, sitting down, standing up, getting back to the chair, sitting up. That's a lot of energy. What about getting up at, out, of, out of bed in the morning? Does that take energy? That takes half of my daily energy. I like my bed. <laughs> Right, half my daily energy it goes to getting my butt out of it. What about have you ever been too tired to eat? Mm -hmm. If you've ever been too tired to eat, you know that eating takes energy. energy. Have you ever been too tired to talk? Yes. Yeah. So talking takes energy. energy. So things that we don't even think about take energy. Do you remember I told you that your body, the furnace, has to burn calories to generate heat? That takes energy. Breathing takes energy. So we're not talking about, you know, planting and gardening and working. We're just talking about surviving mm -hmm. takes energy. If we've only got this much energy to get through the day and we have to toilet and we have to eat and we have to breathe and we have to talk and we have to do all of these things just to survive, can you see how quickly that energy can get depleted? Mm -hmm. Now, if I have to rock this hard and try this many times to get up out of the chair every time I get up, what's that gonna happen? What's that gonna do to my energy level? Well, yeah and now the patient doesn't have the energy to eat dinner what's that going to do to tomorrow's energy levels yeah. yeah do you see how this is a downhill cycle mm -hmm. this is why helping patients with daily activities can be helpful to help them conserve energy that's what this is all about energy conservation and the elderly so if we help that patient stand up so that they can simply stand up rather than rocking and doing multiple tries, then that can help conserve energy so they eat better at lunch or they socialize more at activities and that improves their emotional well-being and just gives them a better quality of life. There's so many things. It's not just put a gate belt around a patient and help them stand up because I have to. It's designed to help improve the overall quality of life of the individual because energy levels fall. 
Now, the problem that CNAs run into a lot is if you go in and you tell Mr. McGillicuddy, I'm here to help you with your shower, and he says, oh, geez, no, I don't have the energy for that today. Mm -hmm. Now, as a CNA, remember, you're way on this end of the energy spectrum. You still have energy up to here. And you look at him and go, well, I'm doing all the work. What do you mean you don't have the energy? Just, I'll, I'll, just let's just get your shower, right? You minimize the fact that they don't have energy. That's like a two-year-old telling you, come on, let's get up and play. Why don't you have energy? You can't come up with it, right? You are at a different level on the spect on the energy spectrum. You have no idea what that lack of energy is doing to them. And if you use that energy that they say they don't have and you force them into the shower, something is going to suffer later. Because they're telling you, I don't have the energy. Even if you're doing all the work, it still takes energy to sit. It still takes energy to be showered. It still takes energy to lift your arms so they can get your armpits. It still takes energy when they're drying you off. Even though you're doing the work, it's still robbing energy from them. So if they say, I don't have it, and you force them, they will have to give something up later. <clears throat> because they can't go to the store and buy more. I don't care what Red Bull is telling you. <laughs> okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You need to understand this if you're gonna be working with the elderly. So we need to arrange the day to benefit the patient. If you have a patient who is a morning person and has higher energy levels in the morning, maybe that would be a good time for showering. If their energy levels drop off drastically after four, you don't want to put them on the night shower schedule. Mm -hmm. They're never going to have enough energy. Now, I am not a morning person. Mm -hmm. No, not me. Right? I need a shower in the morning to get myself going. <laughs> That's the only way I'm going to gain enough energy to get through the day. So I am a morning shower person, but I'm not a morning person. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens when I'm 82. <laughs> I'm on the fence about this. I might need to switch to a night shower because yeah. I'm not a morning person. I'll have the energy in the morning. Does that make sense? Yeah. We need to make sure that we're listening to our patients because your patients are all different. Mm -hmm. They're going to require a different level of care for us from us. And if we make that observation, hey, I have tried to give Nancy a shower now for three weeks in the morning because she's on the morning schedule and she doesn't she, every time she refuses what do you think you should do with that information you know tell the nurse hey morning showers are not working for this person she keeps refusing yeah okay does that make sense yeah. and the nurse won't know that ahead of time no they have no idea no, they rely on us to give them that information so what you need to understand here as a CNA, because this impacts you, is that there is an inverse relationship between strength and energy. So when strength goes up, the energy required to do tasks goes down. It doesn't take you as much energy to do things. Like my husband can walk the dog and it doesn't take a lot of energy because he's very strong. He's very physically active, in great shape, <laughs> right? So he can go walk the dog and come back and he's not winded at all. I mean, he's, he's, he's fine. I go take the dog for a walk because my dog, I, we rescued a dog. He has to walk a mile a day. I'm not kidding. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> but when I go walk the dog and I come back and it's a slight hill to get back to my house, it's like, I want to sit. I'm tired, right? So because my strength is low, the energy required to do tasks is pretty high. His strength is high. The energy required to do tasks, pretty low. Everybody understand that inverse mm -hmm. relationship? Yeah. All right. What do you think the strength levels of your elderly patients are going to be? Oh, low. So how much energy are they going to have to expend to do everyday activities? More. Things we can do to help will prolong their life. That's a good thing. I know it doesn't seem like one. It's a good thing. 
Make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have to remember there is an inverse relationship between strength and energy. So what does this mean for just the regular younger person that's recovering from a surgery? If their strength is low, what is that going to require? What does that mean for their energy? They use more energy. They're going to use more energy. And what do they need to be able to heal? Energy. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. That's a problem, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because if I've got a broken leg and I know that my body needs energy to heal that bone and those muscles that were affected by the break, and because my strength is low, everything I do on a daily basis is going to use up energy. How in the world am I going to have enough energy to heal that broken bone? That's a problem. So we need to understand that when the patient calls and says, I need this, don't roll your eyes at them. They don't have the energy to go do that. If they did, they wouldn't be calling you. We need to go do whatever it is they're asking us to do without the eye rolls and the sighs and all the other attitude, because right now their energy needs to go to whatever has them in this place, whatever they're fighting against. You guys understand that? Mm -hmm. Energy and strength are, are they, they are so connected that when something affects one, it is absolutely going to affect the other. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is a short scale, five minutes or less. This is on page 46. Guys, you're only walking somebody five steps, turning around, walking them back. I mean, it, it doesn't take very long. <laughs> we have an opening in front and a closing behind. That doesn't take very long either, right? This is not a long skill. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about shoe rolls, because this is what's going to govern how we're going to do this skill. Well, we've already talked about the first two. The patient's feet hit floor. We're going to talk about their shoes, right? Because shoes are important. If you remember, the care plan says they're already sitting in a chair with shoes on. But even though they have shoes on, care plan says they have shoes on, that's awesome. You still have to address it. You still have to say something about the shoes. You have to, I see you have shoes on. Do your shoes fit appropriately? Are your shoes fastened well? I don't care what you say. Don't say like, hey, nice kit. That's not really where we're, what we're going for here. We want to do this in a clinical manner, but you have to address their shoes verbally somehow. Slipper socks are not enough. We already know that. When we put the gate belt on, the only way we're going to know it's tight enough is to make sure there's four feet between the belt. Or four feet. Four feet. Four feet. Yeah. Way out here. Four fingers between the belt and the patient. I'm thinking about the next one. And their feet must be flat on the floor. And you have to actually address that. So let me, this is where I was going back. So let me show you this. I am short. You've probably noticed. <laughs> When I sit in a chair and I'm all the way back in the chair, this is why I needed the camera. Mm -hmm. Do you see what happens to my feet? They're not flat. Yeah. Really flat. Mm -hmm. yeah, take a look back here. Yeah, they're not flat. They're not flat. In order for me to get my feet flat on the floor, I have to scoot forward. So for the test, if you're the patient, you are going to be told to sit in the chair with your hips all the way back. So what does that mean for you doing the skill? You got to you got to address their feet. You've got to ask, are your feet? So you can sit with your hips against the back of the chair and your feet hit the floor. You got long legs. <laughs> yeah, I, I the floor is like a foreign land for me, right? So when the evaluator puts the patient in the chair, they're going to make sure that the hips are all the way back because they want you to look at the patient's feet and address, address it. So even though your feet are flat on the floor, I'm going to ask you, are your feet flat on the floor? You, I'm going to say, can you scoot forward so your feet are flat on the floor? But I'm going to say something about the feet being flat on the floor. Flat on the floor. Good. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, if we're going to help somebody stand up, they need to be an active participant. That makes sense. I don't want to carry their whole weight. 
They need to be an active participant. The only way to make somebody an active participant is to count down so they can stand when you're helping them stand. If you just grab the gate belt and yank up, they are not an active participant. And you're probably going to be supporting their entire weight because they weren't ready for it. So you need to make sure that you're giving them a cue, that you're counting, that you're doing something to let them know, okay, we're going to stand on the count of three, one, two, three, up, right? We have to um, involve the patient. Remember, the test is always about distribution. All right. Once we get them standing, we want to ask, are you dizzy? I want to know here. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know over there. Because if I wait till we get over there and I say, oh, yeah, by the way, are you dizzy? And they say yes. What's my exit strategy here? I don't have one, right? So what a lot of CNAs do is they try to rush the patient back to the chair. Guys, they aren't tolerating a slow walk. You really think they're going to do a rush? They're not going to make it. That is a very, very common CNA mistake. If the patient isn't doing well, remember, they'll always give you signs. We talked about this, right? Hand to the head, hand to the stomach, hand out to the wall. They get wobbly, they get pale, they get sweaty. If you see that something is not right, get them sitting on the floor and then get help. Patient sitting on the floor can't fall on the floor. Falls are how injuries happen. If they're not tolerating a slow walk, don't think they're going to tolerate. That's you. You're trying to get back to safety. They're not going to make it. Well, congratulations. You got somewhere safe, but you left your patient behind. So we need to make sure that we're addressing this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I want to know here, when I stand the patient up, I should be asking, how do you feel? Are you weak? Are you dizzy? Are you okay to walk? Something before we get going. And then I probably want to walk, you know, at least watch as I'm ambulating them. So when we're walking, I'm going to have my hand under the gate belt. They're going to be standing in front of me and to one side. Where's my focus? Okay. Yeah, if I've got a, a table in my way, my focus is not on the patient. It has to be on the patient because that's the only way I'm going to know that something is wrong. Okay, so focus is always on the patient. When we get them back to the chair, we're going to help them sit. We're going to back them up and they have to feel this chair behind their knees. So we want to tell them, back up until you feel the chair. Let me know when you feel the chair. Is the chair behind you? I don't care how you say it, but make sure that they've acknowledged that that chair is there because otherwise they will subconsciously resist. If somebody doesn't know that they've got something behind them to catch them, their body will not relax enough to sit. Good. Now, body mechanics. Okay. When you are, when you've got a patient sitting in a chair, it used to be years ago that we would tell healthcare workers to stand knee to knee and toe to toe, right? So if I've got a patient here, if you can see my feet, see my feet. If I have a patient there and I'm standing toe to toe and knee to knee, and I lift that patient up, their entire body weight is moving toward me. <clears throat> now there's a physics principle here. This might sound familiar. You learned it in fifth grade. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if I'm lifting somebody that's 150 pounds up toward me, I have 150 pounds of force that is forcing me backwards. Mm -hmm. That means my body, my back has to counteract 150 pounds of force. That's a huge amount of force on my back yeah. to keep me upright because mm -hmm. my body is going to want to go backwards. Okay, yeah. So in order to prevent that, my body has to counteract that force. That's a, you'll blow out your back. Back injuries extremely common yeah. in CNAs, and it's because of poor body mechanics. So instead of standing in front of somebody, 
where their body weight is going to throw you off balance or cause your body to counteract that force, there's a better way to do it. So if you see where my, my feet are right now, and this is why I wanted the camera, okay? If you see where my feet are, right? My feet are flat on the floor. There's a line right in front of my feet. Can you guys see that? Yes. There's a line on each side of the chair. Can you guys see that? Okay, I'm gonna use that. I'm actually sitting in a box. These lines form a box. Good. What I'm going to do, is put one foot in front of the feet across, perpendicular, like this. The other foot goes parallel. So I'm standing at the corner of the box. And when I lift, when I lift, bend at the knees, when I lift the patient up, their weight is moving forward, not against mine. Okay. This provides a, a, a good level of control without experiencing the counter effects. And it's, all, it's the proper way to lift a patient. Good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me show you how to put a gate belt on. Gate belt should be used. I know that um, a lot of people try to shortcut this and they'll put, uh, or they'll grab the patient by the back of the arms and try to lift them up out of the chair. Guys, in your body, most of your weight is below your waist. Here down. Right? Your legs are way heavier than your arms. Most of your weight is from here down. If you're grabbing up here, you are moving the top half of their body and the bottom half is trailing along, which makes it more force needed to move. So you're going to have to dig in and pull harder. And that increases injury. Some people will grab the waistband of the pants and lift the patient up using the waistband of the pants. Anybody ever have a wedgie? Because <laughs> this is a monster wedgie. Yeah. They'll move. They'll move quick. Man, will they move quick. But they're not moving quick because they have the strength. They're moving quick because you're injuring them. So gait belts should be used. Don't use the arms. Don't use the pants. Use the belt. We want to lift at the center of gravity. Now this is a gate belt, like any other article of clothing, the tag goes on the inside. It doesn't matter whether the buckle goes this way or the buckle goes this way, nobody cares. However you wanna do it, nobody cares. But when you put this around the patient's waist, you wanna make sure that it's not kinked or twisted. You wanna make sure it's flat. The free end goes through the first guard by the alligator teeth. And then you pull the direction the teeth are pointing. See how those teeth are all pointing that way? Mm -hmm. You pull it that way to tighten it. And you need it snug. This is too loose. You want it snug. We get skinnier when we stand up. So if I put this on and it's this loose when the patient is sitting, when I go to lift the patient with it, yeah. it's going to go right up under the breasts or under the arms or they'll just slide right out of it. So you need it snug enough that it's going to stay in place when you lift. And that's four fingers between the belt and the patient. Once you get it snug enough, you're going to take this free end through the second guard and that locks it in place. This tail that's hanging down gets tucked in just to get it out of your way. Okay. Good. Okay. To undo a gate belt, you're going to pull it out through the second guard. Now, if I pull it this way, all it's gonna do is get tighter. If I try to pull it this way, it doesn't loosen. So what you have to do is hold the actual buckle, the buckle itself, and slide it along, do it this way so you guys can see. Hold the tail and slide the buckle along the tail to release it. When you remove the gate belt from around the patient, don't slide it along their skin. That can cause burns and injuries. You want to loop it up and over, or you want to take your hand and bring it around the back. Good. Mm -hmm. Questions?
All right, so again, when we're gonna lift a patient, we put the gate belt on, make sure it's snug. How do we know it's snug? We're gonna to count to three. So the patient's involved. We're gonna stand with one foot perpendicular, one foot parallel at the corner of that box. We're gonna reach around behind the gate belt. So on the sides, if they're a larger individual or around the back, if they're a smaller individual, but you wanna lift at that center of gravity, their hands need to be on your shoulders. Now, the reason for that, if you look at page 45, at the top of the page, you're gonna see somebody lifting with a gate belt. Do you see how the patient's upper body is leaning backwards? Because mm -hmm. we're lifting at the center of gravity, we're pulling up at their middle, but that's causing their top to trail back. What could happen to this patient? Oh, yeah, because their their balance, uh, and they're probably going to take you with them. Yeah, because their balance is being affected by this. To keep the patient moving as a unit, if you have them just lay their hands on your shoulders, not around your neck, not gripping anything, just place your hands on my shoulders, just like this. It keeps their upper body moving as a unit with their lower body. Good. All right, so here are our checkpoints. We need to apply the gate belt while the patient is sitting. Well, duh, because we're gonna use it to stand them up. We're gonna apply the gate belt around the patient's waist over clothing. Guys, that is an actual checklist point. Apply the gate belt while the patient is sitting. So that tells you that people have tested and not done that. They have stood the patient up and applied the gate belt. Which, why? You need the gate belt to stand them up. Mm -hmm. Apply the gate belt around the patient's waist over their clothing. Help to stand by holding the gate belt on both sides or back. We're gonna let the patient lead at their own pace. We're gonna walk slightly behind in one side, holding the belt under hand. Where's your focus supposed to be? Patient. patient. Ask them how they feel. Assist them when standing and sitting, both. And we're not, we're not going to pull that gate belt off across the skin. These are the things they're checking you off on. And we already know all of those now. So we, are, we have now officially mastered all of the principles. Yay. So I'm going to show you this video. Um, way late. I'm going to show you this video real quick. Remember that you have five minutes to complete this skill. Somebody with your level of experience has five minutes to complete this skill. But the video two minutes and 54 seconds, and that includes the whole beginning and the end time. credits. It does not take very long. Okay? Yes. Are you dizzy at all? No. 
Okay, I'm gonna let you leave. We'll walk to that bed. Are you comfortable? Yes. Yeah. Feeling okay? Yes. Yeah. And then you can turn around. We'll walk back to the chair. When you get to the chair, turn around and back up to the back of your legs and the chair, you know it's there. You're gonna put your hands on my shoulders and we're gonna sit the same way we stood. Ready? One, two, three. Very good. Are you comfortable? Yes, yeah, ma'am. Dizzy at all? No, ma'am. Okay, I'm going to remove the gay belt. Is there anything else I can get for you on here? No, ma'am. Magazine, perhaps? No, thank you. Okay, here's your call light. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. I'm going to open your privacy curtain and wash my hands. Thank you. Thank you. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps to my skill, make any corrections, and then tell the evaluator my skill is done. All right, questions? All right. Okay, let's go to page 85. I'm going to show you something pretty cool. Those of you at home, if you have a washcloth available, go get it now. Okay, so I just handed out washcloths to everybody. This is just a plain square washcloth. You guys probably have one of these in the linen closet at home. Nothing special about it. We usually have it folded in half and in half again. And this is how we keep them stored in these little squares, right? Well, instead of looking at it as a square, I want you to turn it a quarter turn and look at it as a diamond. If you put the diamond in your hand with the free ends, you know, all these flaps facing up, the free ends, all the flaps facing up, facing up, and you fold one corner in between your thumb and index finger, the other corner in at your pinky. You hold the washcloth like this. So let me come around and help because some of you are having some issues. And I want the free end facing up. See how the, the tabs are up? Right handed? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the right hand on the right hand. So this is going to go like this. This goes between your thumb, and that one goes there. Okay. okay. So you got it. You got it. Okay. All right. So when you're doing this, the three corners face up. One side corner goes between your thumb and, and hand. The other side corner edges in at your pinky. You can then use this surface to clean a wet body opening and fold it over. That traps the contamination underneath and now you have a new cleaning surface. You fold that over, that traps the contamination underneath. You have a new cleaning surface. You fold that over, that traps the contamination underneath. You have a new cleaning surface and you fold that over and it gives you another new cleaning surface on the back. When we clean a wet body opening, eyes, nose, mouth, 
genitals, rectal area, wounds, sores, rashes, and incisions. We want a new leap for each stroke. Good? So you're going to see this with partial bed bath. We're going to use it again for carry care. We're going to use it again for catheter care. So we're going to use the leaves method for multiple skills. Good? All right. So our care plan here on page 86 tells us to give the resident a partial bed bath and back rub. Oh, that sounds easy enough. Now, when we talk about back rubs, we are not talking about massage therapy, dip, heat tissue, hot stone, anything like that. A back rub is, do you guys remember when you were little and you didn't feel good and mom came along, just kind of rubbed your back a little, always made you feel just a little bit better? Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing here. It wakes up the nerve endings, it promotes circulation, and it just overall makes you feel better. That's all we're doing. So a back rub means we're gonna start at the base of the, the back, you know, at the, the waist area. We're gonna go up in small circles to the shoulders and come back down. We're gonna do it again, small circles, come back down one more time, because we do everything in threes. <laughs> small circles, come back down and we're done. Anytime we apply lotion, what do we have to do after we put it on? Wipe, wipe, wipe off the excess. What do we do before we put it on? Warm, warm, it, warm it up. So you already know this. There is nothing here to teach you, mm -hmm. right? It then tells us, um, so we're going to give the resident a partial bed, bath, and back rub. But pay attention to that partial. Partial does not mean full. It means part. So as CNAs, do we try to figure that out ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the care plan tells us what partial means. This care plan says, wash the resident's face, neck, chest, abdomen, back, one arm and hand. We don't care why we're not washing the other one. We don't care. Maybe it's not there. Maybe it was amputated. Maybe the patient's having a procedure done later today that the soap might interfere with. Maybe the patient's got an IV in it or it could have a blood pressure cuff on it. I don't know, I don't care. We're not washing the other side. But for the test, the reason they have this is because if they watch you wash, rinse and dry one arm, they don't need to see it on the other side. You get to pick which arm you wanna wash. Completely up to you. It says, um, provide a brief back rub with lotion, dress the resident in a hospital gown. Well, that makes sense. Clean body, clean gown. And patient is lying on back in center of bed and can roll as directed, but too weak to assist with baby. So when you turn the patient over, you can ask them, hey, can you scoot toward me? Can you roll on your side? Perfectly okay. The problem is if you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see this is being done on a mannequin. <laughs> you can ask a mannequin all day long to scoot towards you, but they're not going to be really effective at getting it done. So for this skill, you're actually going to scoot the mannequin towards you, roll them on their side. But the reason that that says that is because the patient can stay on their side by themselves. Mannequins can't. So when you turn this mannequin on her side, the evaluator is going to reach over and just hold that mannequin in place for you. Okay, to make it easier for you to do the washing, rinsing, drying, back rub, tie the gown, all of that. So the mannequin will be held in place by the, the evaluator. In a clinical setting, your patient, real people can stay on their sides. But if you've ever played with a Barbie doll, they don't stay on their sides. Mannequins don't either. The evaluator knows that. You're not going to have to ask. It doesn't require a second CNA to assist, nothing like that. They know their role. They know if you're going to do this skill, when you turn the mannequin over, they're just going to reach over and hold it. Okay, good. Questions? All right, well, washing rules apply here. We know our washing rules. The skill starts with an opening. We're going to get a barrier. 
We definitely need gloves because wet body openings on the face. We need a privacy blanket. We know our linen rolls, scoot and roll. Washing rolls. We're going to clean the basin when we're done and the closing. So, man, look at all those principles at the top of the page that this skill encompasses. This is the big boy. This is the one skill that has you performing almost everything on that back wall. Now, if you keep your finger here, but go pack the page 17 for me real quick. You remember these are the testing care plan sets. Mm -hmm. If you notice, this is only on one. It's only on one testing care plan. I think. I don't think it's on two. I think it's on one. Let me just double check that before I make sure. Yeah, it's only on one. It's on um, on the bottom row, the second one in. That's the only care plan set that has this particular skill. So guys, you've only got a one in 11 ch chance of getting this skill. Right. Probably not very common. But if you do get this one, because remember, it takes 19 minutes to do. That's a long time. You get two super short skills to go with it. Super short. So even though this is a long skill and it has all of the steps in it, you know, all of these principles that we have to do, it's an okay skill set to get because the other two that you get with it are really short and easy. Good. Easy peasy, right? All right, let me go ahead and show you this video. That's all the teaching I had to do for this one because we've already learned everything else. So are you seeing that we're building on these principles? We're just using them over and over and over again. So on Wednesday, there's nothing new to learn. I've taught you everything. It's all done. So all we're going to do on Wednesday is rehash these principles, put them in a slightly different order on a different body part, and do some new skills. That's why you'll have more practice time on Wednesday. You're supposed to have practice time today, but I apparently talk too much. Oh, real quick, let's look at while well, we talked about that. Um, we already got over all that. Let's talk about our checkpoints, right? This is what we're being graded on, our testing checkpoints. Testing checkpoint, did you wash face to waist, front and back, and one arm? That, you know, did you wash all the areas on the care plan? There, that's a checkpoint. So follow the care plan, right? We're gonna wash the face first, no soap. We don't wanna use soap on the face because it dries the skin and if it gets in the eyes, it stings. So we're always going to wash the face first, but we're not going to use soap on the face. We want to use the leaves method on wet body openings, which is the face. We're going to control the washcloth during cleaning. So that's why I have you hold it a specific way. You don't want floppy corners. You want to support the arm at the elbow while, when lifting. Well, we've heard that before. You want to replace the water if it gets cold or soapy. Well, that just makes sense. We want to turn the patient on their side to wash, rinse, and dry the back. We give them a brief back rub and we apply a clean gown. These are your testing checkpoints that are specific to this. Plus, you've got all those too. So this is a big skill. If you look, there are 38 steps to this skill. 38 steps. That's insane. It's really big. It also requires... Um, it also requires a lot of time. So this is one that you're definitely going to want to practice. But guys, this right here, this is the checklist. This is the actual testing checklist that they're going to have in front of them when you test. Do you see how many steps there are? You guys see that? This is a big skill. But none of it should be unfamiliar. Show you 
decompose them when you talk to them. All right, so really quickly, somebody look at the bottom of the page. How many minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, somebody with your level of experience should be able to complete the, this in 19 minutes or less. Remember, or less. You don't have to take on 19 minutes. You can do it quicker, but try not to go over because even though you have two super short skills to go with it, um, you do have an overall time for the skills exam. Uh, Okay, do you see how much time I completed in? Yeah, not quite 13 minutes, and that includes all of the front stuff and all of the back stuff, right? So plenty of time. Supplies, I'll be right back. For this field, I'm going to need a barrier for the table. This will give me a clean place to put my clean supplies. For this skill, I will need four washcloths, two towels, a clean gown, and a privacy blanket. It's a washing skill, so I will often need a basin, soap, and lotion. And I'll need a set of gloves. Ms. Jones, let me go get some water. I'll be right back. Jones, it's a water appropriate temperature. Okay. And now I'm going to spread the privacy blanket out over you. This will help keep you warm and protect your privacy while we do this skill. I'm going to spread the blanket without snapping or shaking the blanket. And I'm going to pull your sheet down to about your waist. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to ask you to sit forward for me in just a moment so I can untie your gown. And I'm going to spread this towel out underneath you to keep your sheets dry while we bathe you. Can I assist you to sit up, please? Thank you. I'm going to untie your gown and spread the towel out on the bed. Go ahead and lay back down, Ms. Jones. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to spread the towel out underneath the arm. I'll remove the gown on the side closest to me, supporting the elbow as I lift it. And I'm going to relocate the gown to the other side of the patient. This leaves the patient uncovered underneath the privacy blanket for me. The blanket will keep you warm. Now I can apply my gloves. I'll take the first washcloth and wring it out. And I'm going to use four corners. We'll wash the face first, no soap on the face. Ms. Jones, I'm going to wash your eyes. I'll start with the closest eye to me. I'm going to wash from the inner to outer corner. Very gently, 
and then we'll fold this sleeve over to prevent contamination from spreading to the other eye. So show them one to walk your other eye now, enter the outer corner. We'll fold that leaf over, and then I'm going to wash the remainder of the face. Using very gentle strokes. And gaining control over the washcloth. We'll fold that leaf over and use the final washcloth for the nose. And then we'll set that aside. I'm going to take the towel and pat dry all areas of her face, making sure not to use too much force. We'll set the towel aside. We're going to take the second washcloth and wring it out. And we'll apply soap to the top leaf. We do not need to use the leaves method because all of her skin from this point is intact. We're going to wash behind the ear, under the chin, across the neck, the upper torso. We're going to lift the blanket to protect privacy but keep the patient covered while we wash down to the abdomen and up the side. Now, for the exam, you are going to make sure the patient remains covered until the evaluator is asking to remove the blanket. At that point, you will discontinue on. I am going to repeat these actions so that you can see what I have done. I'll remove the blanket for better visualization. Behind the ears, across the chin, the neck, the upper torso, around the breasts. Down the abdomen and up the side. Then we'll clean down the front of the arm, the hand, up the back of the arm, lifting at the elbow, and the armpit last. We'll set this washcloth aside because it has soap on it. We'll take the third washcloth of the basin and wring it out. And we're going to rinse all the areas that we just washed. So behind the ear, under the chin, across the neck, the upper torso, around the breasts, the abdomen, up the side, down the front of the arm, keeping the elbow supported on the bed. We'll press the hand, the back of the arm, and the arc fit while supporting the arm. The rinse washcloth can go back in the basin for later use. Now we're going to dry all of those areas. So we're going to pat dry or use short, soft strokes, but nothing vigorous. We're going to with your Miss Jones. We'll set the towel aside. Now the patient has a clean torso, so we'll place the clean down on her. Ms. Jones, can you reach your arm through here? I'll help you put your down on. We'll lift the arm at the elbow, supporting it as we lift. And we'll spread the gown out. Okay, Ms. Jones, we're going to go around to the other side of the bed now, and we'll dress the other arm. Since the care plan said that we only needed to wash one arm, we do not need to cleanse this other arm <coughs> for the care plan, but we do need to dress it. So I'll remove the soil gown and we're going to place this in dirty linen. And then I'll put the new gown on. Can you reach through this arm hole? Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and lift. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to ask you to turn on to your left side now. This is going to allow me to wash your back and give you a brief back rub. So I'm going to ask you to scoot toward me and we're going to roll you onto your left side. Ready? Go ahead and scoot toward me. One, two, three. Now the evaluator will hold the mannequin in place while you complete your cleaning. So I'm going to take the third washcloth, bring it out. 
and we'll sew the top leaf. I'm going to wash the back of the neck, the shoulders, and the back down to the waist. We'll set that washcloth aside. We'll take the final washcloth and wring it out. And we're going to rinse all of those areas the back of the neck, the shoulders, and the back down to the waist. And then finally, we'll dry all of those areas the back of the neck, and the shoulders, the back down to the waist. Now, our care plan asks us to give the patient a bring back rub. So, we're going to use a little bit of lotion. Making sure to warm the lotion in our hands before we give them a back rub. Ms. Jones, I'm going to give you a little back rub now. I'm going to start at the small of your back and work my way up in small circles to your shoulder. We'll do this three times. This is for circulation purposes. One, two, one more, and three. I'm going to wipe off the excess lotion. Now I can tie the patients down. And remove the towel that's protecting the linens. Ms. Jones, come on back onto your back, please. And scoot to the middle of the bed. Thank you. I do not want to touch that sheet that's going to go right up next to her face for soiled gloves, but I need my soiled gloves to take care of all of my dirty linens. Ms. Jones, I'll be right back. These items are going to go into dirty linen. Now I'm going to go clean the basement. I'll empty the basement and rinse it. And then pick it up with a paper towel. I'll dry the inside with one paper towel and throw it away. And then dry the outside with a paper towel and throw that away. And I'll get one for the door. I'll collect the soap and the lotion, placing them in the basin. I'll return the basin to its normal storage. Paper towels can be thrown away. This barrier is going to be discarded. And now I can remove my gloves. Okay, Ms. Jones, I'm going to remove your privacy blanket now and pull your sheet back up. Are you comfortable? Good. I'm going to roll the privacy blanket in fall so that the trailing edges don't contaminate other surfaces. This will be placed in dirty linen. Okay, Ms. Jones, is there anything else I can get for you while I'm here? So, this magazine? No? Okay, here's the call line. If you should need anything at all, please let me know. I'm going to go to the privacy curtain and wash my hands. After washing my hands, I'll think about the steps of my skill, make any corrections, and tell the evaluator my skill is done. Questions? This one is it hard one. <laughs> it, there's a lot of steps, so it's a very long skill, and that's a little intimidating for sure. But it's not a hard skill. Um, you just have to remember all the washing rules and all the principles that we've learned so far. Can we get the sheets? Yes, I have them for you. Okay. Uh, real quick. Um, um, I'm sorry. No, 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 it wasn't you. All right, uh, please put your washcloths in the uh, dirty linen. This is for you. And um, I'll print out a registration tag. I have it for you on Wednesday. Okay. And we'll tell them we be here today. Um, I'll be here most of the day, but I'll be in the room. Okay. My mom just has to be on the phone. Oh, okay. So, the internet thing, I don't have Okay, hold on one second. 
you um you. you all have um chapter seven homework to do tonight yeah so don't forget read chapter seven take the test in the white book for chapter seven as well yeah. if you have any questions write them down okay. and make sure that you have access to the online program if not let me know on wednesday and i'll help you with that as well okay thank you thank you thank you. Thank you. you guys have a fantastic day okay. thank you uh, how late did you say that this will be open for testing for practice for practice till four um, yeah this monday mondays and wednesdays mm -hmm. Okay, YouTube world. Anybody have any questions for me before we sign off? Anybody have any questions? If you do, write them in the chat. And um, as I'm getting cleaned up here, I'll take a look. If there's no questions, we'll sign off for today. But if you have any questions for me, put them in the chat. Um, and I'll get to them before we sign off. Teddy, do you know what they pass the test on? What's that? You know what the pass is the advantage to your something. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, they can. All right. Doesn't look like there's any questions in YouTube world. So we're going to go ahead and sign off for today. Please make sure. Um, that you uh, join us on Wednesday for Wednesday's lesson. Thursday is our live, and we do have the game show coming up as well. So uh, if you have any questions, please join us on Wednesday. I'll be happy to address them. Other than that, happy caregiving. Bye, guys.